Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are about to start our day two of our international conference. I will request everybody to be kindly uh, waiting over there with a little bit patience. We are about to start within um, two minutes or three minutes time. Please be there. Thank you.
Good morning to all the dignitaries, professors and scholars present physically as well as virtually. I, on behalf of the Department of Mechanical Engineering of RERHGI, that is Regent Education and Research Foundation Group of Institutions, welcome you all to the second day of this international conference. Straight away, we will begin with the keynote lecture session. Today's keynote speakers include Mr. Udaya Kumar Subramani, Dr. Vidyut Pal, Dr. Shubratu Kumar Ghosh, Dr. Tuba Jamiral, Dr. Kiran Kumar Bila, Dr. John Dev Barma, and Mr. Manoj Kumar. Today's technical sessions will be conducted by Dr. Dipankar Kakuti and Dr. Abhijit Bani. Now that we are going to begin with the keynote lecture session, may I now request our first speaker, Mr. Udaya Kumar Subramani, to be please ready with your presentation. Before that, let me give a short introduction about Mr. Subramani. Mr. Udaya Kumar Subramani is currently serving as Mechanical R&D Engineer at Genius Star Management Consulting Company Limited. He has expertise in design and oversee testing of marine apparatus and equipment, system layouts and detailed drawings and schematics craft models, and drawings of products, etc. Prior to Genius Star Management, he has worked in JCIP Group as Patent Engineer. May I now request Mr. Udaya Kumar Subramani to please start giving your keynote speech. Mr. Subramani, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, I'm able to hear. Uh, are you able to hear me? And uh, can you see my slides? Yes, your slides are visible, sir, and uh, you are audible. So my, my name is Uday Kumar, and uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I'm working as R&D engineer in Genius Star, uh, Genius Star for the past five years. And uh, currently, uh, I'm working in my current projects are wind bindings. I'll introduce about that uh, in a short, short duration and the uh, waste heat map recovery system and uh, engine selection for new ship bales. And uh, further, uh, I'm also uh, responsible for the retrofit job in, my, uh, in, in existing ships. So, so I'll uh, start my... Um, my my place my topic is reverse engineering for retrofit projects in ships so uh, we all know that the today's uh, session is about the reverse engineering for retrofit ships so this process uh, okay a little bit lower so So uh, retrofit is widely used in the uh, marine in, 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 uh, marine uh, industries because of uh, because there are many old ships we cannot uh, every year there is the regulations change so uh, based on the new IMO regulations we in, there there are new technologies need to be applied uh, in in the existing ships so in order to uh, comply with the reg new regulations we uh, we use the reverse engineering methods to uh, apply new technologies in the ships, such as uh, uh, modifying the propulsion systems. So, uh, so that that would be modifying the propulsion system in order to efficiency uh, increase the efficiency and uh, reduce the emissions. And uh, uh, 
and uh, improve the electrical systems and uh, for power generations and other things uh, and uh, and improve the navigation system for accurate uh, accuracy in in the navigation and uh, having uh, improved the ship hull for uh, hydrodynamic and uh, aerodynamic properties so that the ship can uh, sail through the sea uh, uh, easily. So uh, for, uh, the, for uh, up to now, we are integrating ballast water system and uh, uh, scrubber system. So um, the ballast water system is uh, most of, uh, most of uh, us are not familiar with this system. This system is used to uh, eliminate the uh, pollutants from the water, which can uh, from one habitat to other habitat, Be because the ships travel uh, through different habitats. So, in uh, in order to eliminate these uh, pollutants and have harmful organism uh, organism, so that uh, the ballast water system is used. So, for the for this introduction, I'll. Uh, present a short uh, video about that. Can you see the video? Yeah. So uh, in in this video we can see that uh, um, the ship ship is already packed with uh, many components. But uh, uh, in order to integrate the ballast water system, we need to have a three D scan. Um, uh, have a have to do three D scan and then integrate the new system. But uh, because the uh, vo uh, voyage voyage gap between each. Uh, uh, Voyage time between the ships are very, uh, very short. So in the in that duration only we have to install all these components. So in in order to do that, I will introduce about the three D, three D scanning. So basically, we use a. a Ferro 3D, free, Ferro or Freestyle free 3D scanner in order to uh, uh, get a point cloud 3D image so that we can um, create a, create the 3D model of the existing product or a 3D scanning allows for identification of design flaws and issues that may not be visible for visual uh, inspection. 3D scanning allows for the creation of detailed technical drawings and CAD models, which can uh, which can use for uh, quality control and inspection, and uh, for uh, and in, it uh, it can also help for us to me measure and uh, um, for accuracy and existing systems. So 3D scan. Uh, 
series can be used to create the digital model of uh, digital model of all the uh, in, inside of the engine room so that uh, we can study them and uh, um, make an efficient uh, way of designing uh, all uh, all the new components need to be placed so uh, so the retrofit uh, process is first study the 3d scan data and uh, reconstruct uh, reconstruct the 3d model and integrated the integrate the new 3d model in into the existing model in order to comply with the imu regulations and then create a key plan design uh, key plan design and prepare for the fabrication and as soon as the ship are at docks we 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 install it install it within one week or two weeks in order in order to uh, ace up the uh, designing process and installation work so so first we need to uh, uh, what what are the major steps we need to consider for uh, doing the doing the retrofit work is identifying the problems and the limitations what we have in the existing designs because uh, the old ships they are not uh, efficiently designed they 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 have they they don't know uh, they did not know the future uh, technology to be integrated so in the in that way the space is very uh, limited so in order to we also need to comply with the new regulations and uh, evaluate the existing product so we need to de develop a new design that could also uh comply with the regulations and uh, easy to easy to install and uh, we need to initially test uh, all the systems so uh, we need to analyze if if there is like lots of uh, um, bends and curves so it will it affect the system so we need to analyze before we need we are going to implement this this uh, implement this while implementation the designing should be uh, accurate and uh, all the functions should be uh, correctly maintained and uh, for la at last we will do the commissioning so that we can get a, a fully functional system so first first of all we'll prepare a key plan design the in in this drawing we you can see that uh, there is uh, some uh, green lines indicating the exist old old piping systems and old systems integrated and the red line indicates that the new system to be integrated inside the uh, ship so in order to the check that if the system is fun uh, functionally uh, sound so we we will be using some software to analyze those things like a uh, AFT Fathom, uh, which analyzes the hydraulic system of uh, of the system uh, uh, of the ballast water system, so that we 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 don't get any uh, high high pressure issues and uh, water hammer issues. So for the uh, for the continuing, uh, I will also introduce about the exhaust gas scrubber system. Um, uh, this this system is uh, to reduce the sulfur dioxide um, sulfur dioxide from the exhaust gas because uh, from 2020 the new IMO regulations are that uh, to uh, sulfur dioxide concentration should be less than three percent uh, in the ships. So in order to uh, maintain the, the that kind of regulations the uh, exhaust gas scrubber is used um, so so uh, it is similar to the, the retrofit process or this one is similar to the uh, uh, ballast water system but here we have to maintain um, we have to also analyze the exhaust uh, maintain the exhaust gas pressure because the, if we if there is a back pressure issue then we the main engine uh, can be damaged so in order to 
avoid those conditions, there will be a bypass system that we have also designed the bypass system. So um, next I will uh, tell about how, how do we uh, do the 3D scanning and uh, finding the location. So in this uh, image, we can you can see that the, we have already mapped out the required section to be 3D scanned. And uh, this uh, 3D scan uh, locations, uh, ba based on uh, visual locations and uh, scan images, we, we can find the space and uh, sp space and uh, sa sa safe space for the uh, equ equipment. And further, uh, further, uh, we need to register this uh, this three D scan combined together, like putting the puzzles together, so that we can get a full uh, full image of the engine room. So after we get the full image of the engine room, we need to register and uh, uh, place uh, place the all the scans together to get a three D image. Further, um, so after getting the 3D image, it would be very difficult to design all the existing pipes. So we use some uh, other software like points, uh, point cloud, and uh, an infi points, point sense and infi points. The, this software allows us to uh, uh, recreate the existing pipe pipes from the point cloud data, which is already uh, we are we already provided the ISO information and the pipe dimensions information. So this image, you can see that the uh, we, if we provide the uh, boundary condition, it will, all, uh, it will readily uh, extract the pipes. Sim uh, similarly, the point sense can also do the same function. After, after we create, uh, we, we extract the pipes, then we, Need to integrate with the new uh, new system. Here, the uh, pink pink pipes re represent the new system, and the yellow pipes represent the old system, so that uh, we, it can be easily distinguishable where in the drawings. And uh, this one, you, you can see, see that the this uh, we have before image where there is no or no new pipes and uh, we have to measure and uh, measure and uh, uh, get the accurate information from uh, the existing pipe so that we can integrate the new pipe in order to avoid other uh, other pipes to be uh, damaged So in the final integration, uh, it will look like uh, uh, the com integrating the new system with the 3D scan data. Further preparing the working drawing so that uh, for the prefabrication and uh, other stuff. So next, to, uh, in this image, you can see that the, uh, there are structural installation plan. Uh, because uh, this one uh, scrubber system, the, it is uh, installed externally. So in order to um, maintain the structural integrity, this this will be already simulated with the uh, FEM analysis and get uh, and prepare the base uh, base for the scrubber system. So I'll uh, next show you uh, another video regarding the scrubber system.
So in this video, you can see that the uh, installation process and the design uh, process for the scrubber system installation in the uh, ship on board. So uh, basically, we'll uh, so in uh, the basically we'll install the scrubber first and the, prepare the foundation, and then install the deck house in order to uh, protect protect it from the weather conditions. So next, I'll talk about my current. Uh, my current project, which would be wind windings. I'll show you another video and I'll end my presentation. This project is the currently we are uh, developing with bar technology uh, in order to uh, increase the efficiency of the ship. Uh, this is uh, for increase the efficiency of the ship and reduce the carbon uh, carbon emission. By uh, 2030, we uh, IMO according to the IMO regulations, the, uh, all the ships need to be uh, re reduced 40% of the CO2 emissions. So in order to comply with those regulations, we have implemented this technology. Uh, so we, we and bar, bar are working together to implement this for in our ships. So you can see this video. So this one is uh, this this technology is not has been implemented uh, in not many not many in uh, in many ships. So this is a new technology which is going to be implemented in the coming years uh, using the wind sail tech uh, wind sail. Uh, we are going to increase the efficiency of the ships. So that is it for my my part of the project uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. A wonderful presentation we have witnessed. Uh, may I now request uh, from our audience, if anybody has any question, uh, then please pose the question to Subramani, sir. Uh, 
he will be there to answer your doubts to clarify whatever you have in your mind so please ask and make the session interactive i request the audience to clear their doubts to raise questions if they have Anybody there? Any question? Okay, sir. It looks like uh, that presently nobody has any questions related to this. Uh, so once again, I take the opportunity to thank you, Mr. Uday Kumar Subramani. for your meticulous research work and your wonderful presentation thank you sir uh, thank you for having me thank you uh, let's uh, now move on to our next keynote speaker our next speaker today is dr vidyut pal please be ready with your presentation and before the presentation starts let me give a brief introduction about him Dr. Vidyut Pal currently works as an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology, Shibpur. Previously, he served at the University of Portsmouth, UK, as a senior lecturer and lecturer in mechanical engineering. He also worked as a postdoctoral research associate. in the biomechanics research group mechanical engineering department at imperial college london followed by a brief stint as a postdoctoral research fellow in the medical in the medical engineering research group at anglia ruskin university uk his broad research area is computational and experimental orthopedic bio biomechanics he obtained a phd in mechanical engineering that is biomechanics from the indian institute of technology iit kharagpur during his doctoral research study he was also actively engaged in the uk india education and research initiative collaborative research project between the university of southampton uk and iit kharagpur while working at the university of portsmouth he received a research grant from the royal society uk he is a fellow of the higher education academy uk and a member of the institute of engineering and technology UK He has several publications in international journals of repute peer reviewed conferences and patent applications to his credit So may I now request Dr Vidyut Pal to kindly give his keynote presentation Dr Pal please um, Good morning uh, thank you for your kind introduction Am I audible Yeah you are audible Uh, so just let me share my screen is my screen visible now yes absolutely and am i loud enough my voice is clear absolutely audible sir yeah okay thank you very much again uh, so thank you for the opportunity uh, uh, so today's topic uh, as uh, shown on the slide biomechanical analysis of orthopedic implants i'll be talking about few examples uh, from my own research experience that i have uh, done during my uh, phd and postdoc research so uh, just before i begin uh, maybe just for better understanding the audience so is it they are all engineering uh, students over here or only mechanical engineering or any other mix of engineering 
Yes, sir. All, all the attendees are in branch from mechanical engineering. So mechanical engineering are also here. into the jargon terms. So, uh, and I, I, I have about a half an hour, right? Okay, so I'll, I'll talk. Yes, to sir. You can finish in like half an hour. Approximately half an hour. Approximately half an hour. Okay. All right. So uh, let us start. So I'm currently at uh, Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology. Uh, Sipur as an assistant professor in mechanical engineering. So my research area as has been highlighted, uh, so it's computational and orthopedic biomechanics. Now, so before we start talking about, so this is my outline of my presentation, what I will be doing uh, during this next half an hour. So I'll try to give you a brief introduction about biomechanics in uh, particularly what is orthopedic biomechanics, my research area, and then what approaches we take in uh, orthopedic biomechanics research and then I'll talk about a uh, few examples of analysis of orthopedic implants. I uh, will give you some background and then we'll talk about some of the researches that uh, I have carried out. So what is biomechanics? Uh, we know what is mechanics. Mechanics is uh, the analysis, the subject uh, where we basically deal like analyze the forces, the effect of forces on a body, right? And when you talk about biomechanics, so biomechanics means applications of mechanics uh, in some mechanic, uh, like to understand the mechanics of living system. So basically mechanics applied to a biological system or in a biological structure. Now biomechanics is a very broad area. Uh, it has several, uh, some of the areas like you can see, like I've highlighted. So out of this orthopedic biomechanics is my research area. Other than orthopedic biomechanics, you can have dental biomechanics, musculoskeletal biomechanics, you can have tissue engineering, rehabilitation, biomechanics, so many other areas that you can see on the slide and many more, which is not listed here. So within this broad domain, I'll be mainly focusing my presentations on the area of orthopedic biomechanics. Now, you may be aware what is orthopedic biomechanics. So by the term, we mean orthopedic means it's related to bone and joints, right? So something related to bone and joints we'll be talking about. Uh, and when you talk about bone and joints, I'll be mainly referring to the human bone and human joints. So some of the examples you could see here, like I'm showing you some pictures of hip joints. You can uh, see some pictures of knee. You can see some pictures of spine. So I'll be talking some of this, not probably all of this, but I'll be talking some of this uh, during this presentation. So what approaches we take uh, in biomechanics research or when you talk about orthopedic implants, uh, what approaches we take to analyze orthopedic implants? So primarily, the research approaches can be divided into these three major categories, or essentially two categories. So one of them is computational, where you use some computer models to predict the outcome of uh, the joint replacements. When a bone is implanted with some sort of implants, what will be the mechanical behavior of that implanted bone? We can predict that using some computer models and some mechanical engineering tools, like a finite element method. If you, have, if you are all from mechanical engineering background, then probably have heard the name of FEM, finite element method. So you rigorously use finite element uh, model to solve problems in biomechanics. Uh, there are also approaches related to experiments where we carry out different kinds of uh, experiments to find out the mechanical behavior, behavior of implanted bone structures. Uh, the approaches can be combined together. So we can call it also combined computational and experimental approach. Uh, essentially, any computer models that we develop uh, whatever outcome we get from the AP model or finite element model, th those results need to be validated because uh, without validation, computer models doesn't mean much. So for that, often we need to carry out experimental uh, investigations. So often combined computational and experimental investigations are carried out. So these are the approaches we take in our research in terms of method. So with that, let me come to the orthopedic implants. I'll give you some background, and then I'll come to analyze uh, analysis part of the orthopedic implants. Now, when you talk about implants, so why orthopedic implants are used, or what are orthopedic implants? So first of all, uh, like when you talk about orthopedic implants, generally we are referring to a surgery uh, that is known as joint replacement. Now, we might be wondering why joint, joint replacements are required. What are the clinical needs? Now, there are several conditions like osteoarthritis or fracture or rheumatoid arthritis. So there may be some other reasons due to which uh, the 
the patient, I mean, the subjects, they suffer a lot of problems in their jobs that can affect the quality of life. They can also be subjected to severe pain. The rest motions will be restricted. So what happens during like, uh, if I can explain a little bit more here. So if we talk about a normal joint, and this is a, a picture of a hip joint. So what happens in a normal and healthy hip joint, typically at the end of the bone, we have a, a thin, smooth layer of cartilage. And that provides very easy articulation of the joint without pain. But what happens due to osteoarthritis, that cartilage layer may be damaged and that can expose the bone at the end of the joints. That, that causes pain. Um, that's the problem. Okay. So at the severe stage of osteoarthritis, when the medication does not work or the physiotherapy does not work, then typically like surgeon refers you uh, to go for orthopedic surgery where they perform a joint replacement. Okay. So this is sort of the need of the joint replacements. Now, if I focus more on the hip joint that I've shown you earlier. So in hip joint also, there are various kinds of implants. So when they go for joint replacement, what doctors, uh, doctors do, they typically tend to cut some part of the bone and then put an artificial device. Okay. And now those devices, depending on the design, they can be of various shapes. Also, there are different uh, clinical need and clinical uh, uh, sort of requirement uh, that when to use what kind of design designs. So I'm showing you two different types of designs for hip implant here. So what you see on the top is basically we call a surface replacement of the hip joint. This is particularly useful when we go for like uh, the, the subject is very young and active. There are much time left, life left for the patient. Then typically what happens? Only the damaged part of the joint that you see here, only the damaged part of the joint is resurfaced. We do not remove the full joint, but we only resurface the damaged part. And then a cap-like structure is put into here. So that is surface replacement of the hip joint. But on the other hand side, uh, it may be the case like where a part of the bone, the femoral head and the neck, this part is removed here. And then this kind of stemmed implant, as you can see here, it's a long stem. This kind of still long stemmed implant is inserted within the bone. So this kind of implant is called uh, total hip replacement, THR, total hip replacement. So during my PhD research, what I focused on was more on the uh, surface replacement of, hip, of the hip joint. So I'll be talking more on that on. But before I go there, so I think I need to talk about like when these implants are placed inside the bone, how those implants are fixed to the bone. So essentially, there are two mechanisms to fix the implant to the bone. Now, on the left hand side, what you see, we call a cemented fixation, where some kind of bone cement, a material, particular grade of material called bone cement is used surrounding the uh, implant. And that bone cement can hold the implant together with the bone. Whereas there is another kind of fixation because this bone cement may have some disadvantages. So more often surgeons prefer not to use cemented fixation but to go for uncemented fixation. So what is uncemented fixation? They're without use of any bone cement, they try to achieve the fixation through biological fixation. I mean, there'll be some form of uh, structure on the surface of the implant, some porous coating or some structure that will encourage bone to grow into those structure. So that is called uncemented fixation. So this kind of uncemented fixations are more common, uh, particularly for young patients because their bone quality is good enough uh, to grow into uh, structure if that is favorable. So let me talk a little bit about that uh, hip resurfacing, uh, orthoplasty, HRA, the surface replacement that I have mentioned earlier. Now, why that is particularly so popular? Uh, because uh, it's quite evident that with that kind of surgery, we do not have to remove that much of bone. So bone minimal resection is uh, minimal you can restore the biomechanics uh, of the joint uh, much more than the uh, stemmed implant. So there are a whole lot of advantages uh, with this uh, hip resurfacing arthroplasty due to which this is being used, particularly for young and active uh, patients. But still their popularity, uh, it has some sort of, uh, it's not foolproof, you know, that some sort of failure occurs sometime. Uh, sometime it occurs immediately after the surgery within few months, or if it doesn't occur, then in the long term also, uh, it may happen due to some other reason. So in the long term, uh, the failure may be due to the loosening, the implant may be loose from the uh, bone, but in the short term, there might be some sort of fracture, like as you can see here, some sort of 
from the x-ray it is clearly, uh, clearly evident that some sort of crack is propagating and that can lead to catastrophic failure like this what you see though very not very common but it may happen up to certain percentage of cases so our thought was like how to reduce that kind of problem so we had to understand first like what is the mechanisms of those failure why does it fail is there anything to do with the design or is there anything to do with the loading or what is the post potential cause of that failure then what are the design considerations we can think of to improve the performance of that particular design so i'll be talking about those two aspects and then later on uh, i'll be talking about some other aspects of uh, my other other designs now when you talk about this uh, design so primarily i'm talking about this computational modeling approach here i'll be talking about experimental approach also later on but the first one i'll be talking that has uh, that has been performed using computational approach so what we do basically, uh, if you go for finite element modeling of bones, uh, we have to create the geometry of bones, right? So to create the geometry of bone, what you need, you need to create the 3D model of the bone. And being a freeform surface, so it is not very easy to create, like use a 3D CAD modeling software to create a geometry of bone, which looks like a very realistic geometry. So we try to kind of create the geometry of bone starting from some medical CT scan data. So you get some CT scan data, and then you sort of do reverse engineering. That means like you basically you post process them. You know, you get the scan from the patient, and then you segment or do several steps of image processing through which you can finally create the three D model of the bone. And then that three D model of the bone can be exported to some finite element software where you can develop the finite element models. And then you can go for analyzing. There are different steps of AP modeling. So I'll be gradually showing you step by step. Then we can go and do the analysis. Okay, so the same thing that I have shown here in, just in terms of block diagram. So we can uh, collect images, then we do some image processing, then we do some solid modeling. And that solid modeling can be used for visualization plus also for finite element analysis. Now, when you talk about finite element modeling, so we have obtained the geometry from CT scan data. Now we also need material property, right? So how do you get the material property? Now, when you talk about the implant, implant may be made of some metal, medical grade metals or alloys. Their material properties are well known, well established. But when you talk about a particular bone model, uh, then bone model, material property for the bone, uh, typically it's not consistent. Consistent in the sense, not uniform. Okay, like it, it may vary from point to point or location to location within the same bone. So it, there is no single material property that we can easily assign to the full bone model. So it is basically non-homogeneous distribution. So to capture the non-homogeneous distribution of material properties, uh, we try to extract those material properties based on image data only. So when the CT scan is performed, depending on the density of bone, uh, the CT scans are associated with like each voxels or each pixels of the CT scans, they are associated with some gray value. So the gray value are easily obtained from like the CT scan data, then those gray value can be used to calculate the apparent density of bone. So there are some form of empirical relationships established in the literature that tells you the relationship between uh, the gray value and the density, apparent density rho and the gray value that is denoted by HU. And it has been established in the literature that there is some form of linear relationships. And that linear relationship can be established easily for a specific data set. So once we know this specific relationship for a particular data set, we can obtain the density from the gray value. Once you have obtained the gray value, then again, there are some form of empirical relationships like this. Uh, so where we can calculate the elastic modulus of bone elements using the particular density, where A and B, there are two constants. And those two constants uh, have been widely investigated in the literature. A range of values are reported. For a given uh, kind of case, we can suitably choose the value of A and B. So this way, we can basically assign each bone element in the model a uh, non-homogeneous distributions of material property. So once we have assigned material properties from the CT scan data, next we can think of like uh, what is the interface conditions between different parts that we can see. Because in this particular case, what you see, we have got a bone model. Then we have got, say, implant. In this particular case, we have used cemented fixation. So we have got also got cement. 
Now, in between implant and cement, there is an interface. Between cement and bone, there is an interface. Between this stem and the bone, there is an interface. So, how those interface will behave? Will there be like will they be tightly bonded, or will there be a little bit of sliding frictions? Uh, so, depending on that, we have simulated a whole range of possible interface characteristics that have been listed here. Uh, maybe I will not have that much of time to go and discuss in details, uh, but but in a sense, uh, in uh, quickly I can uh, kind of uh, tell you. So what we have done, the the stem and the bone, the interface between the stem and the bone is very very crucial. So what is the purpose of the stem? Uh, some surgeons say that uh, it does not take part in load transfer from the implant to the bone. It is only for guiding. Okay, so when they do the surgery, the stem is only used. Uh, to visually guide the surgeons, the placement of the implant within the bone. But on the other hand, it cannot be guaranteed that the, there is no contact between the stem and the bone. Even if you make a large size hole in the bone to put the stem in, but overall, like in the like over time, the bone may grow into that gap, and then there might be like uh, possible that there will be contact established between the stem and the bone. So there might be some load transfer possible. So to take into account of all those things. We have taken varieties of uh, stem bone interface contact conditions as shown here, this part. And other part we have kind of simplified. We have assumed that implant and cement uh, is the most, uh, the weak, weak part of the implant bone structure. Most of the failures occur here. So we have assumed a debonded uh, coefficient of, uh, with a coefficient of friction of 0.3, debonded contact there. But the cement and bone, we have assumed fully bonded. So then uh, the implant material was made of uh, cobalt chrome molybdenum alloy. We have used 3D solid elements, quadratic tetrahedra. So with that, we have created the different interfaces of the FE model. Then, so for what loading we are going to analyze it. Uh, the loading conditions that we have assumed, uh, they are kind of the peak load corresponding to normal walking and stair climbing. So there may be some other activities that can be considered but we have taken these two primary loading that more commonly done by uh, the patient, normal walking and stair climbing. Uh, those loading are corresponding to like, uh, they, they include uh, hip contact force, muscle forces, various muscle forces, the details of the magnitude of load and other things, uh, the attachment of the muscles and the detection of the forces are reported in the literature as shown here. So the data were taken from the literature and then Considering a particular body weight of the patient, those force can be calculated and applied at the right location. Then obviously we did some model verification and validation in terms of mesh sensitivity. Also in terms of, uh, we could not do a, a experimental validation of this particular bone model because the data was from a live patient. So we had to somehow think of like, are there any published literature which has done an experiment can it do like our FE model uh, performance of that FE model? Uh, and we can compare that with the published literature. So we found a literature which has done some experiments and we solved our model for the equivalent loading that they have done in their study. And we found, then we compared some results and the results were found comparable, very comparable. So that way we tried to indirectly validate and verify our model. So then we also thought of how bone will be behaving or the implant will be behaving in the long term because what happens there is a phenomenon called stress shielding when an implant is put in the bone originally when there was no implant uh, bone takes the full load but once an implant is placed implant is much stiffer than the bone bones material property is something say cortical bone is 17 to 18 gigapascal whereas uh, this cobalt chrome molybdenum alloy they may have a elastic modulus of say more than 200 gigapascal so there is a 10 time difference. So due to that difference in material properties, in the implanted bone, the distributions of the load will be different. And that will cause some sort of bone remodeling because bone is a biologically active material. It reacts to the load that it receives. If it receives more load, it can make the structure, uh, adapt the structure accordingly. If it doesn't receive enough load, then it would gradually become weaker. Okay, so this phenomenon is called bone remodeling. So we wanted to check whether once the implant is placed in the bone, how that bone structure will behave in the long term, whether the density will be more or density will be low, so that you can predict the performance of this implant in the long term. So there are some established uh, theories for bone remodeling based on some mechanical stimulus. Uh, we can calculate the mechanical stimulus. 
uh, for the intact bone when there's no implant and also for the implanted bone when there is implant and then we can compare and there are some rules bone remodeling rules uh, proposed by the uh, proposed in the literature so some of the references are shown here so considering this uh, we can simulate the effect of bone remodeling how the bone will behave in the long term whether they are going to be increase of bone density or reduction of bone density increase of bone density is probably good but reduction of bone density means the density of the bone is getting low so the bone is getting weaker that means there will be chances of implant loosening in the long term so i may not be able to go and discuss about all the mathematical details of the bone remodeling uh, here in this short presentation uh, but if anyone is interested maybe we can talk later uh, so basically, I'll just put a little bit of effort here. So how do we do bone remodeling simulation? So essentially, we have an intact femur when there is no bone, uh, no implant, and we have the same bone implanted with the implant. Okay, we have the implanted femur. We apply the same load for the implanted femur to the intact femur, and then we calculate the stimulus. The stimulus may be like some stress or strain-based parameters. In this particular case, we have chosen strain energy density. So that stimulus we get for the implanted femur, stimulus we get from the intact femur. These two stimulus are compared. We take the difference and then we compare the difference with the bone remodeling rule. And depending on the rule that the mathematical equations I have briefly shown in the previous slide, then the changes in bone density can be obtained. And that changes in density is related to changes in elastic modulus. And then you get a new bone model with updated elastic modulus. Then you rerun the simulations until you reach to the equilibrium. So I'm showing you some uh, results here. Uh, what, uh, sorry, I think someone's calling me, so I hope this is not urgent. Okay, so I'm showing you some results. Uh, what you see in the uh, left-hand side is uh, the stain distributions in the intact bone. Okay, so this is the pattern of distribution cycle. You can see that uh, the load is being transmitted from the femoral head to the center of the head and then coming to the medial cortex. But when you come to the implanted bone, we can see the load distribution has completely changed here. So a lot of the, this blue color means, if you look at this legend here, the blue color means the magnitude of stain is very, very low, right? So that means this part of the bone is not receiving enough load. So that is what stress ceiling I referred earlier. So in the intact bone, there is a lot of strain here, but in the implanted bone, not much strain here. So that means this will lead to some sort of bone remodeling in the long term. But in the short term, what is happening? We can see here, like some form of strain concentration is observed at the junction of the implant and the neck. And then that is disappearing once we do bone remodeling. That strain concentration magnitude is reducing. And at the same time, if you look at here, some form of bone uh, high stain is shown at the tip of the stain. So that means there is some form of load transfer taking place from the stain to the bone, right? So this peak stain here at this junction is basically indicating a risk of neck fracture in the short term. As we have seen clinically that uh, there may be risk of neck fracture in the short term. So this is giving an indication that because of the sharp changes in the geometry here, there will be stain concentrations and risk of neck fracture in the short term. But why this does not happen in the long term? Because if you do bone remodeling and you change the, check the results, what you see here, uh, so in terms of, let me talk about the implant failure in the long term. So what is happening here? So this is the bone density predictions. This is post-operative and this is after bone remodeling equilibrium. So what is happening? As you can see here, uh, the density in this part of the bone is say in this color zone, something around 0.3 to 0.4 gram per centimeter cube. Whereas in the implanted case, after bone remodeling e equilibrium is achieved, you can see here this part of the bone is subjected to reduction in bone density, right? So that is again had reduced to 0 to 0.1. So that means the density of the bone elements from here, this particular zone has reduced to some value like 0 to 0 0.1. So the reduction in bone density means there is a chance of implant loosening. So this model has particularly uh, explained that in the short term, there may be risk of neck fracture due to that stain concentration in the neck. And in the long term, due to the reduction of bone density in some part of uh, the bone underlying the implant, there may be risk of implant loosening. 
So now that our model could explain the potential short term and long term failure mechanisms, then we thought then what we possibly could do to reduce the risk of fracture. So intuitively, we thought of changing the design in terms of the stem, because we have seen that some form of load transfer takes place, right? This is also indicated here because some increase in bone density is observed here, right? So that means due to the increase in strain at this part due to load transfer, the density has increased. So then we have seen because that stem takes part in load transfer and that load transfer is taking away from far away from the uh, which would be uh, in natural case. So we thought maybe we can reduce the length of the stain, but how how much we can reduce? It was not clear. So then to decide that, what we thought of, so if you look at an X-ray image of a natural bone, so what you see here within these two red bands, there are some sort of arrangements of the trabecula of the bone. So this sort of band is showing the natural load transfer path from the top of the head through the center to the medial cortex. So this is the typical load transfer path, major principal compressive band, we call it. And that sort of band is also visible from our simulation results where you see like the load is being transformed from, it's a very similar pattern to this. So then we thought if this is the load transfer path, then what is the current configurations of the implant we have? So if we look at the current configurations of the implant, we see like the load transfer is taking place here, which ideally it should be somewhere within this zone, but it is taking far away from, taking place far away from this. So that means this is something not desired. So possibly we can reduce the length of the stem up to an extent so that uh, the load transfer falls within this band. But someone may say like, why not much shorter than this? Now, why not much shorter than this? Because the reason I have said earlier, the stem as claimed by the surgeon that they use this stem also for visual guidance during the surgery. So we need to keep a little bit of clearance from the rim, tip of the rim from here to the tip of the stem so that there's a little bit of clearance surgeons could visually see and guide during the surgery. So that's why you need to keep a little bit of clearance. So we could possibly reduce this up to that much by max. So, but if you calculate this, the length, etc., then this length was typically roughly equal to the diameter of the implant. Now we can reduce this up to the approximately half of the full length. Then we can keep the load transfer band within the original band. So it was expected that this will lead to more favorable load transfer. And then we have done these simulations uh, of bone remodeling. And then we have compared between the short and long stem. Now you could see in the long stem where we had originally this part of the bone subjected to some density reduction in the short stem that reduction, bone density reduction is not present. So that means it is saying, uh, saying that the short stem results in the long term, the chances of implant loosening due to density reduction or bone remodeling would be much, much lower compared to the long stem. So short stem was a better prospect. Now, obviously this is a study that a picture that I'm showing, uh, this is not our study, but uh, some other research groups in Imperial College London, they have carried out similar research work um, they have also found out similar sort of uh, findings uh, as us, and they have taken this idea forward and they have uh, worked col in collaboration with some orthopedic surgeons in the hospital and some orthopedic implant manufacturer manufacturers. And this particular short stem resurfacing implant is currently under clinical trial. They're using it on human. So the idea that you have also investigated, the other research groups, they have also investigated. The findings were very similar and the idea has been taken forward by them uh, to use in uh, human. All right, so I hope uh, I could uh, briefly explain you like an example of hip resurfacing arthroplasty. How did you do the analysis, right? Now, in I think, do I have a little bit more time? Um, yeah, you may continue, sir. OK, so I think I'll be, I'll be taking five, or, um, five minutes or, or something like that. Yes, sir. Okay, so next I would like to talk about uh, another kind of implants or in a couple of other implants. So this is typically uh, any a product development cycle. This is also applicable for orthopedic implant. So essentially you start with a feasibility study, like what are the requirements right, of a new designs. Then we come up with some initial conceptual design. We do detailed design. Then 
we try to find out like we try to do some study so that we can verify our idea and then if the idea is working fine then we can go for at least for prototyping and then you can go for mechanical testing of that particular design then once this is all working we can think of doing some design transfer right and then it can go to the clinical trial but between each step there will be some review you may have to go back and forth between different steps so that you can establish your design idea that it's working fine so we've kind of applied this sort of design cycle or product development cycle to design new implants for osteoporotic femur now what do i mean by osteoporotic femur is so osteoporosis is a condition where the bone density is getting lower due to aging and also there are certain changes within the internal structure of the bone the bone becomes very fragile and their strength becomes low so as you can see here in the normal bone uh, this is a kind of sample fruit geometric design of the internal medullary canal uh, as the osteoporosis progresses that can lead to like more stroke pipe or cylindrical shape and as you can see here the diameter of the canal med medullary canal that we call is also increasing as compared to the healthy femur but as such there are no specific designs uh, available commercially that caters to the need of osteoporotic femur so currently what is done is that the design for the normal healthy population the same design is used for this population obviously as you can see there are improvements of need for improved shape improved fixation and also you need to reduce the steepness of the implant we have earlier highlighted the case of stress shielding because we have to use very large size diameter of the implant here that means the steepness of the implant will be going higher compared to the normal cases so we have to reduce some steepness so we came up with some idea to reduce the steepness of the implant uh, what is the idea the idea was like to use combination of various geometries and various materials so that you could reduce the steepness and at the same time that will encourage bone growth on the surface of the implant so maybe i'll not go to discuss the features uh, of important features of the implant uh, but the concept was like you have a central core then from the central core some sort of buttress is protruding out and in between the buttresses you can have some bone substitute material uh, that will encourage bone growth and at the tip of the buttresses you could have some porous structures that will reduce the stiffness of the implant right so we did some CAD modeling and then also we applied for patents some patent applications uh, you could probably see it yet to be granted but uh, we made some applications international basis then we did some analysis we did prototyping we did AP analysis and then he compared the results to find out like whether the design is good enough uh, the, for the this purpose that we have designed it for right so we're not going to discuss much of those results but because we talked about the porous structures we are using so we carried out some studies like what kind of porous structures can be used what should be the porosity what will be the orientation of the pores so that we can achieve a stiffness which is close enough to the stiffness of the bone so another implant uh, that we are going to talk about, uh, it was on uh, knee implant, revision knee implant. So when we call it revision knee, means the when surgeons have done the first surgery, that is known as primary knee. Okay, but if the primary knee fails for some reason, then surgeons have to take out that one and put a second one. The second one we call revision knee surgery. So during revision knee surgery, there are a lot of problems we find, like some bone defects. Uh, presence within the bone as possible now to cater or uh, to avoid this kind of problems uh, so typically the current treatment practices they use very long stem because we do not want load to be transferred in this defective area defective area so they use very long stem as you can see here so that this part of the joint will be devoid of load okay so load will be transferred far down here load will be transferred much off here away from the joint space but if you go for that sort of treatment, the problem is if, if the bone doesn't receive enough load in this part, then the bone will remodel. That means this part of the bone will much become much weaker. So that way, in the long term, the implant will be again going to fail. So we thought of, is there any way we can increase the load transfer in this part of the bone, in the proximal uh, distal part of the femur and the proximal part of the uh, tibia? So we came up with some alternative idea where we used some extra cortical plate and we ensured that the load will be transferred uh, more proximally 
compared to these particular configurations. So with that one also, we went for patent application publications, various components of the implants we have shown here. And then we have done some experimental study in this particular case to find out how like to establish our claim that this particular design will give you more favorable load transfer. So what we did was uh, we used a digital image correlation study uh, where we have used that, like we have used composite bone and we have got that those sort of designs implanted uh, here. And then that is loaded on a mechanical testing machine. And then digital image correlation is a technique, optical based technique, it's a non-contact uh, stain measurement tool. So you have some cameras looking at the specimen and then there are some form of speckle pattern in the surface of the specimen. As you continue applying loading at regular interval, the camera will be looking at them and they'll be capturing some photographs. And then there are some algorithm. So you can compare the deformation from the uh, deformation of the specimen from the speckle pattern at different time intervals. So you can basically look at the pictures at different intervals. And then from the speckle pattern, you can calculate the deformation of the specimen. And from the deformation, you can calculate the strain, right? So we did that kind of study and we have published this work uh, in medical engineering and physics. So with that, I think uh, I'll probably conclude. So I had a couple of more slides. So this particular study we had, uh, we have used combination of approaches, both finite element plus experiments. And in this particular case, we have used so final element modeling plus mechanical testing uh, of cadaveric bone, so uh, bone from uh, the donors. So we have also then validated our results, like whatever results you have got from the FE model in terms of, uh, we tried to predict bone fracture in this particular case. So we applied load to create fractures within the bone. And we compared the FE predicted results to that with the experimentally observed uh, stain pattern. And we found like the results are very much similar between the FE and the uh, experimental results. So with these few examples, maybe I'll conclude my talk. So I would like to acknowledge all my sponsors and all the places that I work, I have worked for. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Questions, uh, you can feel free to write to me. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, of course, uh, I think uh, a kind of uh, very innovative one. So uh, the audience, I guess, we will also agree on this. So from the audience, uh, may I have any curious questions? Uh, then you can uh, ask the questions to sir. He's there to answer you. Audience, I insist that if you have any question, please ask that. Sir is there to answer. Sir, I mean, yes. No. Sir, in slide 30, you have said uh, grown bone growth elements. Sir, can you explain what are those bone growth elements? Slide 30. <laughs> you mean bone substitute, you mean, right? Okay. So let me share the screen again then. The screen is visible, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So you mean this bone substitute? Bone growth element. No, so this is slide number 30. Next slide or something, sir. Bone growth element. We're applying. Uh, did, did you refer to this uh, bone growth element? You mean? I forgot the slide number. Uh, is it yeah, in, in this part of the presentation or uh, before that? Yes, sir, in, the, in this slide. Sir. Yeah, in this slide. In the core part. So this is a core part, right? And what I said, the, you have a central core, which is running uh, to the central part of this design. And then from that central part of the core, which is shown in green color, you could see some radial buttresses portrayed out, right? 
And those radial vertices can be made of the same material as the core. But at the outside surface of that vertices, what you see, you see some different color, right? And those are indicated like this is for the porous structure. These are the parts where, what we have made porous. And you could see some slots created in between those vertices, right? So this V sort of set. set. There we have to some bone substitute material. Now, what is bone substitute material is, so they are basically artificial uh, laboratory prepared materials which closely mimic the mechanical properties of bone. Okay, so some like hydroxy appetite based material prepared in the lab, and they are now available commercially uh, to treat various kinds of small bone defects present in the bone for various reasons. So the properties of those bone substitute material is like that, because by composition, they are very close to the bone. Uh, so it is expected that the bone substitute, will, uh, substitute material will encourage also the natural bone to grow and connect with those sort of structure. So that's why like uh, we talked about that bone can grow into those structure, number one. And also the porous structures, the nature of the porous structure is like this because we have uh, pores in there. So they also can help the bone from the body. The bone cells will move into those spaces in the pore, pore area and then they can proliferate or they can differentiate into bone. Right. So they, that way, those porous structures can also help the bone to grow into the porous structure. So by bone growth, I mean, uh, obviously, they are biological process. Uh, in this particular work, we have not shown any simulation to show all those uh, bone in growth, like biological process, simulation of the biological processes. But currently, we are working on that sort of aspects, like how we can really simulate how much bone will grow depending on what mechanical environment we have got within the structure. Okay. In dental application, there is novavin or something which helps the bone. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So some some bone support material that will encourage bone to grow, and they they will be actually only scaffold. Yes, there are various commercial available names. Uh, so also the, in dental areas, also there are a lot of applications of bone substitute materials. Sir, may I contact you later for Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the contact address, uh, email address is shown at the last slide. So. Feel free to contact me if you have any further query. Okay. Okay. Uh, any further questions from anybody? Can we take uh, other questions also? Good morning, sir. Myself, Papia. Yes. Hello, sir. Morning. I'm audible. Yes, you are. Sir, my question is. Uh, uh, the whole uh, design we are doing uh, you are doing from which software sir in mechanical prospect i'm asking okay so there are various softwares actually that we have to use for doing the whole thing so once we do this uh, medical image processing uh, we typically use some softwares called mimics for the medical image processing part one, once it comes to the CAD modeling of the implants, we typically use SOLIDWORKS, but you can go for some other CAD modeling tools. Uh, for okay. the so basically, we are doing from, uh, in our mechanical engineering, we are doing from um, uh, so SOLIDWORKS and AutoCAD, sir? Yeah, yeah SOLIDWORKS is a good tool for 3D CAD modeling. And then for the finite element analysis part, uh, I used ANSYS for those studies that I have shown you. But there are other lot of a lot other lot of other tools like Abacus or some other finite element tools also available. And in between, you may need some post processing where you may have to use your own some uh, programming language like MATLAB or Python. That can also do handy. So there are various softwares uh, that can be used, uh, at least for this computational aspect. And for the experimental part, definitely you have to use the available facilities within your lab. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, my another question is: uh, you are uh, you are uh, telling that we are uh, you are doing some mechanical uh, testing, sir. So, what is that mechanical testing? Is that sir tensile means that mechanical uh, testing means sir tensile stress um, that type of testing, sir? Yes. So, the primarily the results that I have shown you here, uh, the experimental investigations that I have done, the last part of the presentations we have. Uh, it was basically compression testing okay but how you orient the specimen uh, that will vary depending on what you want to find out so the last part of the presentation what i have shown the hip fracture study there the femur was sort of like it was simulating a falling configurations if someone falls on the on the side then what will be the position of and orientation of the bone we have to orient the bone in the same fashion in the machine 
but for the first part of the study that i have not shown the experimental part of it we had another study doing similar things in the experiment uh, but for that part we have to position the implant or orient the uh, bone sorry orient the bone within the test testing machine uh, so that it can replicate the physiological orientation like if you are standing typically the femur bone uh, makes an angle with the vertical plane and with the, uh, the longitudinal planes and the sagittal plane. So we have to mimic those arrangement of the orientation for which you may have to design some jigs and fixture. And also you may have to apply, design some sort of loading mechanisms and then you can apply compressive load on the head of the femur. So that part I have not shown and also they are not part of my presentation here. Those slides are not available right now. But I could have shown you otherwise how did you do the experiment. Uh, so then we do some mechanical testing. So here, primarily, we have done compression testing. Compression. Okay. Fact, yeah, compression testing we have done. Uh, but you can go think of also twisting, like torsion testing, or you can think of also bending testing. But that, that will be dependent on what you want to achieve, what is your purpose. And then we measure, like, uh, uh, basically, we want to find out the stress and uh, strains throughout the structure. So some cases, we use strain gauges. We mounted strain gauges on the surface of the bone and we did some localized measurement of strains. In some other cases, the experiments with DIC, digital image correlation, that we have shown, we calculated the strains in the whole surface of the bone. Okay, sir. My last question is, sir, in that research, sir, how many uh, how many people are involved in the team members? Uh, is that only by you or other members also involved in that uh, research, sir? Well, I mean, uh, when it comes to comes to the, the numerical modeling part, the computer modeling part, so it was primarily me. But when it comes to the experiment, then obviously I have to take help from uh, other people, like whoever is working in the lab or uh, in the different, like to prepare the jigs and fixtures. Uh, I have to do the designs on the CAD, using CAD, and then I have to go to the manufacturers uh, or to the workshop, asking them to prepare that for me. But I have to do the design and explain them, this is my purpose and this is what I'm trying to achieve. So they will prepare the jigs and fixtures for you. And then during the experiment, you may get help of the technicians who are supporting the machines. Etc. But primarily in terms of idea and execution, it is primarily me. But depending on the nature of the job, if it is experimental, then definitely you need more help. Uh, someone to operate the machine, someone to get your jigs and fixtures prepared or manufactured. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, any further questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Uh, a bit louder will be helping. Oh, am I audible, madam? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, one thing uh, I might miss that part actually, sir. Uh, uh, I was very much curious that uh, what are the implant materials here? Uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, you have said it earlier a little bit, but I actually missed that part. So okay. I am seeking for forgiveness, but uh, could you please, sir, again tell me that? Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, no worries. Okay. So uh, for the first part of the implant that I have done, so the surface replacement, uh, that implant was made of cobalt chrome molybdenum alloy. Okay. Well. And in the later part of the designs that I have shown, maybe I have not uh, mentioned the implant material, uh, but in the later part when I talked about osteoporotic femur, so there we used uh, titanium alloy, right? TI6L4V, titanium aluminum vanadium alloy. And also for the uh, revision knee implant, we have used that same material, TI6, AL4V. Okay, so different grades of materials are available, like uh, there are grades of stainless steel, there are grades of uh, titanium alloy, there are grades of cobalt chrome alloy. But titanium, out of those three uh, common met metallic alloys, titanium having the lowest elastic modulus, uh, we prefer to use titanium for different uh, applications. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. OK. OK, uh, so that uh, ends uh, this, the second round of uh, keynote address, keynote speech. So thank you, Dr. Vidyut Pal, for your lovely presentation and uh, the way patiently you have answered the questions, you have taken them, and you have clarified the doubts. So thank you once again. And uh, now you. we are going thank to you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, and uh, with this, we are going to move on to our next speaker.
for today. Our next speaker is Dr. Shubhrata Kumar Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh, please be ready with your presentation. And before the presentation is starting, let me give a brief introduction about him. Dr. Shubhrata Kumar Ghosh is currently employed as Assistant Professor in Department of Mechanical Engineering of National Institute of Technology, Agartala. His main research interest is material processing, coating, machining, and joining, etc. He has published more than 25 articles in reputed journals, book chapters, and international conferences. So over to Dr. Ghosh. Dr. Good. Ghosh, please. Yes, good morning to all of you present here. And uh, very nice talk also I have listened from Dr. Paul. He's a very good speaker. I have, I know him. Okay, so, uh, okay, uh, just I'm, uh, can I present now? Yeah, sure, please proceed. Just a minute. My screen is visible, no? Yes, it is visible. Is it okay? Yeah, it is. Okay, fine. Okay, let's start. Uh, first of all, thank you the full organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to deliver on uh, keynote speaker lecture. Actually, today I'll develop the lecture on that, uh, how to develop composites material by friction star processing technique. Okay, because nowadays, you know, these composite materials are applied in every industry starting from the industry as well as like aerospace, automobile, even though uh, it is applicable for the uh, for the biomaterials also. So this actually the friction star processing is a, another technique to develop this kind of composites. Uh, coming to the next slide. Okay, first, what is composites? Means everybody know that what is composite nowadays because it's a very common materials, advanced material also. So since this is advanced material, so that is the requirement of, uh, of processing of advanced technique. So that is why I have chosen the uh, friction star processing because it's advanced technique to process this kind of composite materials. What is composite materials? It's a combination of two materials, means one should be the matrix just to follow the cursor and another is the reinforcement. When both are combined together, then this is the composite materials. And uh, uh, that you can you can see the the application part mainly that aluminum based matrix that is highly applicable for the industry as well as magnesium, other ceramic composite also. So it's having wide application in the several aspects. And uh, you can see the very natural source of composite. Just here I am highlighting one uh, example only that is bamboo piece. You know these are all different composite materials because. You see, if you uh, see the under the microscope one cross section of bamboo piece, you can find a lot of reinforcement that is uniformly distributed, uniformly distributed. So what we are making here, we are making the artificial reinforcement means artificial composite materials for our application purpose. But these are all natural. So everything is coming from the nature, taking the view from the nature we are implementing in our daily life. So that is our motto in case of any kind of research field. So what is basically composite materials means what are the composite materials like polymer matrix composite, metal matrix composite and ceramic matrix composite. So these are all the three broad classification of the matrix. Now, if you think about the reinforcement shape and size, then the matrix that composite material will be among the uh, another four categories like particulate reinforced composite that is very simple that particles are distributed 
and uh, that diagram also I have not shown here because it's a common thing and flex composite you can see that lot of flex are distributed over the composite materials and the uh, fiber also that is fiber reinforced composites lot of fibers will be distributed and the laminated composite that is very important uh, especially for the ship building industry because you see one ship total structure that is made through the laminated object manufacturing process because where the very high strength is required if any collision any other thing is happening so you requirement have that uh, the high strength so that is why the laminated object manufacturing can give a very nice solutions for that okay so the function of the reinforcement here actually this reinforcement basically is improving the overall properties because single metal or single alloy like aluminium single alloy cannot give the solutions for your application purpose but if you do some kind of composite materials means if you add some reinforcement so that can enhance the overall properties of the composite materials so several methods are there to in order to fabricate this kind of composites several methods are there like star casting spray deposition liquid metallurgy powder metallurgy and friction star processing as well as laser sintering so here just i am going to discuss about the friction star processing technique by this technique we can develop the the this kind of composite materials friction star welding means everybody know that because it's a solid state welding process basically this welding technique will be applied to process the composite materials in a other way so friction star welding is a technique just you follow the diagram there will be one pin okay the tool will be there actually tool is having that there is pin the base is the basic material this workpiece material okay so this suppose this is moving from left to right direction okay and it's moving in the anti clockwise direction so this tool this pin will be penetrating into the workpiece material and finally it is moving from left to right direction and in this case the material is flowing means material is actually whenever this kind of processing is going on friction is a very big role here it is playing mane playing because because of this frictions the heat would be generated but this heat means uh, the parallel temperature will be raised but but this temperature will not be sufficient enough to the, to this uh, workpiece material okay na so so the it's a solid state welding because material will reach up to the plastic point only okay the, there will be plastic flow of the materials so that is why so in the left side you see this is called retreating side in the right side this is called advancing side means material will be taken from the retreating side and this will be moving to advancing side and this is fully cyclic process so and uh, this is you see this nugget is formed actually this is the uh, star zone the, that is called nugget okay so this is solder and this is the pin so solder is continuously touching over the workpiece this is mainly also this uh, creating the frictions along with the pin also next is the the parameters whenever you are processing something there is a very important parameter should be there Okay, like a tool design is a big parameter here because uh, the tool may have pin also. This pin also may be varieties. Okay, maybe it is conical shape, maybe it is cylindrical shape, and pin may be also threaded also. And the RPM means tool rotation also another parameter to control this processing technique. And speed also important parameter and axial force. So mainly these four parameters are very much influential parameters to to influence this full processing technique just here i am trying to show some uh, the video so that it will be more clear for you to understand this basic process of the friction star welding you see this pin is there solder is there both are touching and this will be moving so because of the friction the material is becoming heated temperature will rise but it is not reaching to melting point above the recrystallization temperature that will be heated and plastic flow of the material will be done because material is fully reaching to the plastic zone and that is called this is solid state welding there is no fusion there is no melting okay 
it's a simple one so in case of this don't mix between friction star welding as well as processing because both principle are same but in the other way in an unconventional way we are thinking to process the material how to do that's the i'll des describe later okay so coming to the next slide again okay so you see the application already i have said you in this is applicable for the aerospace as well as the building industry other industry also that can be applicable now i am highlighting one case study for this because just uh, the here i have talked how to form this composite now i have done some composite material development with the help of some scholar okay so that one case study i am described now okay this the fabrication of the mos2 as well as cerium oxide reinforced aluminium matrix hybrid composite and investigation investigation on the effect of the process parameters so what the alloy material i have chosen here aluminium based that is 7075 alloy okay and the elemental composition that is also highlighted here and the the strength several density strength means yield strength ultimate tensile strength elongation micro hardness this is available for this means these are available for this material okay and uh, this is the uh, the acm morphology of the mos2 as well as cerium oxide particles you see the say just only distributions after uh, purchasing the particles from the market just we have seen the acm morphology of this particle uh, this is the basic experimental setup here you see this this is available in nit agartala also that there is a, a friction star welding machine this is a control unit from here you can put your program and you can control full your operation okay now what is the fabrication process that is very important because previously i have said you the welding technique that is established already but Parallelly, we are thinking to develop the composite materials. In case of this, you already previously I mentioned composite means alloy plus reinforcement. So you have to add the reinforcement. Reinforcement is not in your alloy material. Suppose any reinforcement material like CO2 or MOS2 I have applied. How? First, I have to create one groove. Here, there is no two part. Find it. In case of welding, you are joining two pieces. Understand? But here is only one piece. But at the middle, we are making some groove. Okay, that is maybe that uh, the semicircle or some kind of V groove also. And after making this groove, we are pouring our ceramic particle inside. And whatever ceramic particle that will be spreaded over the top surface, that has to be eliminated. Okay, after cleaning the surface, just we will place this workpiece under the tool. And initially, that tool will be moving there is no pin initially because first tool should be touched with the workpiece and because of this frictions some skin surface of material that will be moving and because of that these groups will be filled means ceramic particles that should not be coming out during the main part third step we are following that with pin this so, uh, this tool is moving with pin and with some particular speed at that time, the whatever the ceramic particles are inside in the groove, so that will be distributed over the workpiece material. So that is the main idea. Just we are distributing the ceramic particles inside the material so that it will create some composite. Taken at the solid state also, when the temperature is reaching to some up to certain extent, there will be a lot of metallurgical bonds. So the ceramic particles will not be spread very loosely there will be some kind of metallurgical bond also okay and thermocouple you can fix in order to judge how much temperature that is rising in the workpiece material okay so this is a typical shape of tool that is shown here uh, all my scholar did like that he used this pin okay this pin is little bit cylindrical type and threaded okay so geometry also is shown here and here i have chosen few the the parameters like tool rotational speed transverse speed number of passes one and two and tilt angle and flange depth means how much depth the pin is inside 
and the ratio of MOS2 as well as CO2 that is varying. Initially, it was like 100, 0, then 80, 20, 60, 40, 40, 20, 80, and 0, 100. In order to check the influence of this kind of ceramic particles, okay. And this is the technique after developing just uh, we have taken the, this sample to create some standard specimen like suppose if you want to test the tensile strength. So ASTM standard you have to follow E8. So from this you can create some kind of specimen as well as for the micro harness testing you can uh, take it out some few portions microstructure also and XRD also. This is the methods of characterization. Now come to the results. So here the axial force and transverse force that we have measured that is basically just you see in the first graph that is A, 18A, the, the processing length continuously that is increasing. No, but axial force gradually that is decreasing and also it is look like a constant also. Decreasing why? Because the heat is transferred through the conduction method. So the, the, the previous means previous portion of material that is just ahead of the tool that is little bit plasticide that is why the axial force is going down and transfer speed also it's look like having the same trend okay and now if you look into the first pass as well as second pass in the second graph in the figure 19 you can find that there's a comparison between the first pass as well as second pass the second pass also necessary why because i have said you in, in case of natural composite the reinforcement are uniformly distributed but we are making the artificial composite so there is a very very a challenging one to distribute the reinforcement particle uniformly that is why we are following these several passes maybe one maybe maybe, maybe this is two maybe this is three but not like that it will be 10 12 15 like that because that will lead the uh, other kind of defects so it's better to choose one and two that's to get the better uniformation means of the distribution side so that you can get very nicely because you can avoid the clustering effect also and now here the graph you can see with respect to rotational speed as well as axial force graph here the four varieties of trans transverse speed is highlighted you can see in case of the 600 rotational rpm you are the uh, at the transverse speed like 70 millimeter per minute you are getting the maximum axial average axial force and the second graph this is a average transfer force in case of 600 again it is showing the the maximum axial force because the the slow speed it's not giving so much friction time kind of things so that the plasticity that is not improved too much so because of that force may be high and here you see the some optical micrographs it is clearly seen that the clustering this is the first figure you see in the left side the clustering means where the, where the uh, some reinforcement particles that will be agglomerated at a particular point means this is not distributed over the full zone nugget zone and also you can see some kind of onion ring because there is a circular motion of the material so obviously after uh, completion of your uh, the experimentation you can find some kind of onion rings and here in the figure number E, you can see the uniform distribution of the ceramic particles. And here also you can find in the C figure, some coarser grains are available, okay? And the, the finer uh, grains also, it, parallelly, it is uh, available. And this is the ACM morphology of the specimen. Here you can see some particles that is dis distributed almost in a uniform way. So that is our intention to distribute the reinforcement particle because the, what is the role of reinforcement here? Because whenever you are applying some force into composite material, basically this, this string means this force will be transferred to the reinforcement also. So this reinforcement will help to withstand this kind of load. So that is why the reinforcements are spreaded in the composite material. Here also you can see the distribution of the MOS2 as well as cerium oxide that is distributed in the composite materials. This is the XRD graph, already you know this. Here you can see some, this aluminum is existing. MOS2 as well as CO2, obviously it's, it should be there. As well as some intermetallic compound also you can find. So that indicate there is a lot of metallurgical bonding is happening continuously. 
okay and this is the graph basically that average grain size with respect to rotational speed here one beauty thing is that at the 600 rpm you are getting very good grain size and parallelly at the end and because of this basically this here the heat generation is playing very important role in case of this heat generation because the because of the temperature because of the temperature the grain orientation will be happening always so because of that only this average grain size are varying with the respect to the rotational speed and this is the for the first pass in the see, figure a and uh, in case of figure b this is for second pass okay because in the second pass you are finding that average grain size is less because at that time the whatever grains in the first pass that is created again that is reformed and trying to provide the more finer grains so the because of that this average grain size of this case in the second pass that is less and that is the tensile behavior just you see we have processed the material it's showing fully ductile in nature okay and similar to ductile yield strength also very improved okay for the first pass that is blue line and second line for the that is the second pass in case if you compare between first pass and second pass you can easily it is visible that overall yield strength and other properties that is improved for the second pass because of the overall distribution is well that is why and if you look the fractured surface under the acm so you can see a lot of dimples and fractured particles also you can see okay and this is this is basically ductile fracture is happening in case of tensile failure here the typical the graph uh, that is between the yield strength as well as rotational speed for the first pass and this is a second pass here also this the typical variations with the uts value as well as rotational speed for the first pass as well as second pass okay so that here for the 1200 to 1500 rpm it's showing the better yield strength and in case of this uts value for the 1200 to 1500 it's showing the better uts value and the second pass is showing the better results because of the overall distribution is well and this is the elongations obviously that there is also same trend we are following but in case of you see this in case of second pass elongation is little bit less because any material if the in case of first pass that it's the material is little bit ductile, duct, ductile. so ductility basically in the second pass that is dropping okay because uh, thing is that on the if you think about the reinforcement materials means these are all ceramic materials fine so the ceramic materials nothing but the brittle materials so brittle materials is having the low ductility very few uh, very simple so here in the second pass the because of the overall distributions of the particles the overall ductility it is becoming less but the but overall other properties like other different properties like hardness corrosion resistance wear resistance these are improved so we always we are looking for a moderate level of different properties because for your application purpose you are not requiring only the ductility should be very high or uts should be very high like that you should requirement of the good uts value good yield strength good corrosion resistance good wear resistance so in this way you have to develop some kind of product which can offer you the in all respect that is good okay and uh, you can follow the micro harness value also in the previous case that in the previous uh, diagram you see the elongation that is decreasing in case of second pass but if you think about the micro harness value here you can see the for the 1200 to 1500 the micro harness value that is increasing so that is good in the previous case that is not good in the first pass but in the second pass it's offering good so that is why it's you are getting a moderate level of other properties now think about the uh, wear behavior because this is having a high application in the ship building as well as aerospace industry so wear also another factor because the otherwise material will worn out very quickly okay so if you uh, compare between the friction coefficient with the rotational speed at the 600 as well as 800 is showing better results and the second pass also the 600 and 800 is showing the better results so in case of friction coefficient so naturally if the coefficient friction is i means the here also you can see the specific wire rate 
that uh, how it is changing means 600 to 800 that is uh, 1800 that is the, in the, at the level of 600 the specific wire rate is very high at the level of the 800 also the specific wire rate is very high but the 1200 to 1500 this range can offer you the better results in case of wire resistance this is the the wire track diagram means the SEM morphology of the wire track here you can see the how this kind of sliding wire is happening like sometime adhesion is there sometime groups are there because material is flown from the particular space okay so this is this kind of uh, it's a look like of the abrasive wire is happening because reinforcement particles are there so these particles will be coming out and the, this will act as a abrasive so because of that this kind of wire is look like a abrasive wire okay because the wire testing you know there will be some kind of pin will be there and this will be rotating over the surface so in between pin as well as workpiece if the abrasive is coming so that will create the wear okay so this kind of wear is happening corrosion resistance is very important suppose you are using this in the shipbuilding industry so it will stay for long long days and few months even also this sieve on in the water so there may be some kind of corrosion may be started so that is why we have tested the corrosion resistance also corrosion potential and corrosion current density that we have tested this is the varying with the rotational speed because of the uh, overall distribution of this reinforcement because moh2 and co2 this is having very nice uh, reinforcement in case of the wear resistance as well as corrosion resistance property and here you can see the corrosion rate how it is changing so 600 and 1800 we are getting the better results of corrosion resistance and in case of second pass also we can have the similar kind of trend almost okay that in case of 600 and 800 we are getting the better corrosion resistance so the inferences like the effect of the process parameter basically the second pass is very important here it's playing a very good role and uh, it's offering your good distribution of the reinforcement particle in order to attain your main goal you want to finally you want to get success to develop this kind of composite materials uh, with the help of the friction star processing technique and the particle distributions improve with increase of tool rotational speed and reduction of the transfer speed and highest tensile strength micro harness wire resistance is obtained for the composite that is for 1500 to 40 millimeter per minute and for the second pass okay and second pass composite so the inferior corrosion behavior due to the fine grain structure as the grain boundaries create the micro galvanic couple okay now so the second pass is showing the better results in case of all respect because of the overall distributions of the reinforcement particle in the matrix and here also that you can attend the wear and corrosion resistance of aluminum corrosion resistance of aluminum alloy is enhanced okay the tensile strength that is 92 percent and micro hardness 98 percent is reduced compared to the as received alloy okay and the composite with best tensile strength or wire resistance shows the very low improvement in corrosion resistance than the aluminum alloy okay and parameters set like the 1500 rpm to 40 mm per meter, minute and second pass is selected for the further processing further processing means that uh, suppose this technique is showing some results so further processing means like you can follow some heat treatment process or addition of other reinforcement particle because whatever you are not getting here if you do some kind of other methods you can add the some more extra properties in this composite materials okay so that is the one case study i have highlighted here so this is my talk only okay so these are all references and uh, thank you so if you have any questions hey. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shubhrata Kumar Ghosh. Wonderful presentation it was, indeed. Uh, and like sir has mentioned, uh, the audience, uh, do you have any question? Then please pose your questions to sir. Sir is happy to answer. Audience, questions please.
I repeat, audience, do you have any question? Anybody? Okay, no problem. Means that is okay. Okay, yeah, I think uh, there is no question right at this moment. Uh, so exactly. once again, I... Whenever they have, don't have question, either they have not understood anything or they have understood clearly. So which one I don't know, but it's okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I think they have they must have understood because uh, the approach was meticulous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the presentation but, was uh, quite meticulous. So uh, there is a comprehensibility. Uh, anyway, so no questions for the present moment. Uh, so yeah, I thank again, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, thank you so much. And with this, uh, yeah, our first session. I have a question. Okay, okay, please, free. Uh, please, uh, please uh, shoot your question. Sir, your presentation was crystal clear, and uh, it, I am too much glad about the process as yes, it is also my topic, also PhD topic. So I have one doubt about this topic. Uh, can I implement this process for the other materials like as polymer material or ferrous material, any ferrous material steel? Actually, yes, you can apply. Actually, why there is a limitation of the machine also because friction star welding machine, uh, actually, there's a huge amount of torque will be generated. So, machine has to withstand this kind of torque. So, that is why it's highly dependent on the uh, machine configuration. You can go for the ferrous alloy also. At that time, you have to. I have not talked about the tool material. I mean, suppose if you are using a, a cubic boron nitride, it's a tool material. So, if you want to work on the steel, and some super alloy, even the titanium based alloy also, what Dr. Paul said that about the biomedical implants, if you want to process this kind of material also, so here you cannot do this kind of uh, porous material because of the, it's a solid state welding on, uh, processing only. But thing is that here also you can do the titanium based alloy fabrication or composite material also for the biomedical application, but uh, you have to change the tool because the machine has to withstand this kind of torque. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Thank you once again, Dr. Ghosh. Yes, and sir. with this, yeah, with this, uh, we are ending our first session of keynote speech. So, with this keynote speech, first session ends, and we are going to take up with the technical session now. Um, the first technical session that will be taken and conducted by Dr. Dipankar Kakuti. So, Dr. Kakuti, uh, please be there to conduct the session. And before the session formally begins, uh, let me just give a brief introduction about Dr. Kakuti. Dr. Dipankar Kakuti works as assistant professor in D.Y. Patel College of Engineering Akode Pune. His area of interest are dual fuel operation, methanol induction in diesel engine, engine characterization, biodiesel, CNG, LPG, ethanol, hydrogen, computational fluid dynamics, finite element method. Over to Dr. Kakuti. You may start your technical session now. Yes, uh, good afternoon to all. So uh, can we st start this session with uh, the f our first candidate? Uh, yeah, sure, so, please yes. proceed. Yes, uh, our first candidate, uh, the topic of our first candidate is uh, on the application of the mean field homogenization for transversely isotropic matrix. So uh, I request all of the candidates uh, to uh, finish their presentation within uh, 10 minutes uh, because there is a, a time constraint. So I request our first candidate to proceed with his uh, presentation. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mayank. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. You just start sharing. Yes, I'm. I'm sharing my screen. Yes, yes, please. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Ah, uh, yes. 
okay yeah. uh, so hello everyone my name is mayank and i am presenting uh, uh, my paper on on the application of mean field homogenization for transversely isotropic matrix i am a uh, mtech students at uh, iit kharagpur uh, so uh, for my presentation what what we have done in our uh, research is that uh, since composite material are a uh, uh, new thing in the market and a not, lot of research has not been done in this field what we have done is to find out the uh, analytical methods from which we can find out the properties of the uh, composite material as you know that the composite material are uh, composite materials are uh, a mixture of more than two materials so it is very very difficult to find out the properties of the heterogeneous material right now uh, the method which are available in my, uh, in the field are a finite element method but they are very very time consuming uh, so we have uh, we have uh, uh, predicted the capability of a mori tanaka method which is used to find out the properties of uh, composite material so mori tanaka method is perfectly fine for isotropic matrix but when the uh, matrix become transversely isotropic uh, and then in that case we want to test the uh, test the accuracy of it so in this paper uh, we are going to present the same so the theory behind is that the stress strain relationship with the linear elastic region is given by sigma ij is equal to cijkl into epsilon kl so this epsilon is the uh, elastic strain and uh, sigma is the elastic uh, stress and the c is the stiffness matrix of the material uh, so uh, the first development was done by uh, shlb in 1957 where he uh, find out a method to uh, find out the effective properties of the composite material by SLB tensor. So SLB tensor relates uh, the strain in any fiber uh, to the eigenstrain. So eigenstrain is basically any inclusion when uh, when it is not constrained from any surrounding and the strain developed in it when it is not constrained from any surrounding. So let's say uh, let me uh, so let's say this is a matrix material and this is a fiber. So if I take the fiber out from the matrix material and then apply an uh, external strain, so it will it will either uh, it will deform to a certain extent. When so the, that strain is known as the eigenstrain. So SLB tensor relates that eigenstrain to the constraint strain. So uh, there are some expression for SLB tensor for isotropic material, but not uh, not uh, many literatures had described the SLB tensor for an isotropic medium. Because they are very very difficult to calculate, and I think SLB is the best uh, SLB tensor is the best method to find out the overall properties of the composite material. So there are few literatures we have uh, who have tried to calculate the SLB tensor for a transversely isotropic media, and we want to find out the uh, we want to test the accuracy of. So for Mori Tanaka formulation, so SLB tensor was uh, applicable for that. Uh, when there is a single inclusion and, and which is uh, and the inclusion is in a matrix uh, but uh, as you know that the one fiber also affects the uh, properties of the other fibers so let's say there is a uh, there is some stress in the stress in one fiber that stress will also affect the uh, stress in the other fiber so mori tanaka was the who was the first who uh, related these strains uh, these stresses and the strains uh, uh, in the individual fiber and also to the overall, overall fibers. So strain concentration tensor. So strain concentration tensor basically relates the strain in some. Uh, you... I request uh, the other candidates to mute your mics, please. So the strain concentration tensor is basically uh, the strain which relates the strain in the fiber to the applied strain so if there is a single inclusion and the matrix then in that case that strain concentration tensor is known as dilute strain concentration tensor so for any individual fiber it is given by this expression uh, where this i is the identity matrix s is the shelby tensor cm is the uh, stiffness matrix of the matrix material and then c alpha is the stiffness matrix of the individual fiber and uh, this again cm is the stiffness matrix of the matrix but if i want to uh, you know study uh, if, uh, study the effect of other other uh, fibers on that particular fiber then this is given by strain concentration tensor 
so strain concentration tensor is given by this so this am is again the dilute concentration tensor and then vm is the volume fraction of the uh, matrix uh, i is the identity matrix and then v beta uh, this is the volume fraction of that a particular fiber for which we are calculating the strain concentration tensor and then again in this am is the dilute strain concentration tensor so in 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 this way we can find out the effect of the other inclusion on that particular uh, inclusion also and then again so this uh, this uh, so the strain in any particular inclusion is given by then uh, this uh, strain concentration tensor and this uh, epsilon naught is the externally applied strain so uh, now we have the strain in that particular fiber so we can calculate the stress in that fiber and uh, for uh, this is for the fibers and to calculate the strain concentration tensor for the matrix uh, we can calculate it this way and uh, again, again the same way we have the strain in the matrix and then uh, stress in the matrix by uh, this method so finally when we have all the uh, formulas for all the uh, all the all the things we can calculate the effective net matrix effective stiffness matrix of the overall composite which is given by this formula so this cm is the effectiveness matrix of the matrix material this v alpha is the volume fraction of that fiber or inclusion and this c alpha is the effectiveness matrix of the uh, inclusion and this cm is the effectiveness matrix of the matrix and this e alpha is the strain concentration tensor so now uh, to test the validity of this method when it is applied to transversely isotropic matrix uh, we have uh, developed a finite element model uh, which were help which were generated with the help of a uh, matlab code so basically uh, uh, we have tested uh, we have tested this method on prolate ellipsoid so prolate ellipsoid is basically when is uh, when a ellipse is rotated about its major axis so this is a uh, prolate ellipsoid uh, and this is oblate ellipsoid uh, so we have done our experiment or finite element modeling or for the prolate ellipsoid uh, so uh, uh, we have done we have uh, we have tested it on abacus and uh, we have done the analysis for two aspect ratios uh, that is 3 and 10 so aspect ratio is for, uh, basically a by b so a is the uh, semi major axis of the ellipsoid and b is the semi uh, minor axis of the ellipsoid so these these are the uh, finite element motor, uh, models we have generated uh, so these uh, these are the fibers with aspect ratio 3 and number of fibers in this uh, model were kept at 40 and this this model is for uh, aspect ratio 10 and number of fibers in this model were kept at 20 uh, this is because there was difficulty in meshing uh, if we have kept the number of fibers in this uh, in this model as 40 uh, that is why we have reduced the number of fibers in this model yeah, Maya, I am interrupting you, your presentation. So just make it fast and uh, go to the your conclusion slide. Okay, okay. So for results, uh, we can see. Uh, so the C11 and C22 of the composite. So C11 uh, and C22 of the composite, we can see there is a clear match between the FE, uh, FE results and the Moritanaga formulation. And there is an exact match. Uh, there's a very close match for average stresses in the fiber in the matrix and the average stresses in the uh, uh, s22 for uh, uh, there there is some gap at higher aspect ratio uh, for fiber and the matrix so we can conclude from this that the fe results and moritanaga results match for a lower aspect ratio uh, for aspect ratio of 10 which is higher aspect ratio we can clearly see that the uh, there is a deviation uh, when we go at a higher modulus mismatch, so this x-axis is basically uh, Young's modulus of the fiber, and this is the C11 of the composite. Similarly, uh, this axis is a Young's modulus of the fiber, Young's modulus of the fiber, Young's modulus of the fiber. Uh, so we can see that that uh, as we go from uh, lower to higher modulus mismatch between the fiber and the matrix, uh, we can see there is a clear deviation. Uh, in the uh, for the similar cases of S11 uh, in the fiber stresses, uh, stresses, and also the effective properties of the uh, overall composite uh, so so the we can conclude from this result that the fe results and uh, moritanaka result deviate at higher aspect ratio of the fiber so we can conclude uh, from our study that the moritanaka is an excellent mean field homogenization scheme for a transversely isotropic matrix uh, when all the fibers are aligned in the uh, direction of the anisotropy of the matrix 
but it is not a good uh, method when uh, it is not a good method when the uh, when the modulus mismatch between the fiber and the matrix is high and also it poorly predicts the results when the matrix anisotropic axis from that of the fibers alignment axis so fibers are aligned in the x direction that means the semi major axis of the fibers is in the x direction but if we change the semi major axis of the fibers in the y direction then the mohitanaka uh, method does not uh, predict the results to that accuracy so that is all from our study if you have any question you can ask yeah thank you mr bayan uh, uh first of all i want to acknowledge your uh, uh, you have chosen a very interesting topic yeah, it's a exactly. very very insightful presentation so uh, others uh, if you have any questions please you may ask them okay so thank you mr mayank uh, thank you sir. now yeah now we can uh, proceed to the next candidate am i audible yes Yes, sir. Uh, our next candidate, please uh, proceed with your presentation. Yes, Mr. Uh, yes, Rupam Das. Yes. Yes, sir. Am I audible? My yes, screen yes. is visible, sir. Yes, yes. Hmm. Please proceed. Hello, hello. Yes. Thank you. Sir. Hello. Yes. Yes. Anybody interrupt me? No, no. Actually, uh, Rupam, just hold a hold a minute. Uh, first, uh, the Shojin Patra will present the his slide. After completion of the Shruti Patra, you will proceed your presentation. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So, good afternoon, everyone. I am Shruti Patra, and I am going to present my today's presentation, which is recent development of biomass torrefaction process and its challenges. And my co-authors are Anurag Chakraborty and Amitabh Gautam, and we are from Department of Mechanical Engineering, Techno India University, Salt Lake. so uh, before starting the presentation these are the contents of my presentation some introduction about the um, biomass and the recent trend the classification of biomass torrefaction process principles the several techniques are used for torrefaction process and the main advancement which is done the past two and three decades um, in torrefaction process and the techniques and lastly the conclusion so here some introduction the supply and the traditional energy sources like coal crude oil natural gas are eventually run out so we need to think positive according to indian uh, energy outlook uh, 2021 due to the growth wage and living standard in india not only in india the global actually the current the third largest energy user in the world especially india is the third largest energy user since 21st century the energy demand is gradually increase and 80% uh, demand is still actually uh, completed by coal gas and uh, well so rest the 20% we have to think about uh, another process to meet the rest of the demand of the energy and reduce the environmental pollution in india the renewable energy sources such as torrefied biomass that is used in the industry as well as the domestic sector so first we think about what is the biomass the biomass is any kind of organic plant it may be element matter it can be a Uh, actually um, carbohydrate and composite polymers some amount of inorganic matter low molecular weight extract from organic constituents so this is the classification of the plant biomass the plant biomass are classified mainly two for low mo molecular and uh, second one is macro molecular substance there are several uh, actually there are speculation there is organic matter inorganic matter lignin ash component cellulose and polycellulose I am running uh, time. That's why I am putting my presentation. And the classification of biomass, the biomass is mainly classified by two major sources. The first uh, primary sources and secondary sources. Primary sources, which is uh, the forestry, the agricultural sector, and from the forestry we can use the dedicated forestry, forestry uh, product such wood, willow, blocks, and the agriculture sector, the agriculture residue, which is uh, crop from oil, sugar, and agriculture residue. and the secondary uh, sources that is industry and uh, industrial waste sources um, uh, that is industrial residues such solid waste waste from paper mill uh, some municipal waste 
Now we think about the torrefaction process. So why we need the torrefaction process? What is the main uh, actually disadvantage of uh, um, raw biomass? So raw biomass is a lower moisture content, low calorific value, poor grindability, and uh, actually low bulk density. So uh, to reduce these uh, properties, to improve the uh, actually the calorific value, grindability, volatile content. So we need to think about the torrefaction process. So torrefaction process is the control process of combination, actually biomass heated in the temperature range of 200 to 300 degrees centigrade in a oxygen-free, as a purely oxygen-free environment, or the low, uh, small amount of oxygen environment we can actually done our experiments. To provide the non-oxidizing exposed mayor, um, atmosphere, uh, nitrogen is the most commonly used, uh, actually, uh, gas. <coughs> carrier gas, we use the nitrogen. Uh, the thermal method, which is below 200, are used for wood preservation, while the higher temperature in the torrefaction method are used in for energy purpose. In the addition to the temperature, torrefaction time, or duration is another important factor in determination of the performance of torrefaction. Torrefaction can be carried out between the several minutes, several hours. It can be anything. This process leads to the moisture reduction and the main inform actually main um, uh, aspect or main um, uh, actually um, uh, focus is the transforming uh, transformation of biomass into the product of the uh, comparable which is comparable with coal. <coughs> so this is the principle uh, actually the torrefaction principle uh, which is all uh, earlier described. So untreated biomass uh, combustion technique uh, we can add the fuel or air, it may depend on for uh, dry torrefaction or wet torrefaction. Wet torrefaction, we need uh, actually um, uh, wet torrefaction, we use some water or some uh, actually um, liquid element, uh, then the combustion uh, start. And after drying, the um, torrefaction actually done at 200 to 300 degrees centigrade temperature with uh, actually addition of the nitrogen or may, may we, uh, we may use uh, argon, uh, actually non-reactive gas, and finally we get the torrefied biomass. So this is the torrefaction technique. So this figure indicates the change in biomass color and the chemical reaction that happens in the biomass at different temperature and the different thermal pretreatment process. So we see the heating, drying, intermediate heating, torrefaction, and cooling. The carb shows the each and every step. So uh, uh, it describes the process of the first considering the temperature zone that is called a non-reactive zone that is 50 to 150 degrees centigrade and that is the uh, second uh, one is the reactive zone that is 150 to 200 and the third one is the destructive uh, actually 300, 200 to 300 degrees centigrade. The various biomass reaction in this temperature regime actually three types of uh, regime temperature regimes are there. Uh, so dehydration and uh, devolatilization and the third one is the polymerization. <coughs> so in these three tapes, actually torrefaction uh, happens and torrefaction is uh, done. This change depends on the temperature and the resident time, heating time, biomass type, and the different properties of biomass. Now this so is the classification. This is a article, yeah? oh, so please tell yeah, 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 me. In the future, oh, okay. Okay, 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 okay. So the, this is the classification of the products. The some um, uh, some research are ultra um, uh, done in ultra mild condition. Some are done in moderate condition, and some are done high condition, and they get the different values. So I am skipping this slide actually. So this is the main uh, actually uh, things in um, our presentation. The, what is the material and what are the methods and what are the actually uh, materials? The uh, raw uh, grass biomass, pitula, pine woods, sawdust, rice, sugar cane. These are the actually um, main material and crops that is leftover crops that is uh, straw, sugar cane, biogases, and some waste feedstock such as the crude waste and some in municipal waste. And the average size, actually, the, um, uh, we use that is 20 mm and 6 mm diameter. And the force applied is 4,000 uh, 4, to 5,000 kilonewton, and the holding time is 45. So, uh, and this is, these are the properties of the raw biomass, uh, actually, sorry, torrefied biomass, the proximate advances, heating valences, and grindability. These are the result of the uh, different researchers done their research. Uh, the approximate and ultimate analysis. These are the ultimate analysis data. 
and these are the um, proximity analysis data which is actually in different journal different reputed journal and this is the heating value analysis we can see and this is the grindability index uh, actually i have to explain this side because this is a very uh, actually in, uh, important in, uh, property actually so okay, grindability improvement okay okay summary so these are the uh, conclusion of my presentation biomass actually biomass is recognized the worldwide the resource like fossil fuel so there are huge limitation such as low bulk density low energy density to overcome this limitation we increase uh, actually um property uh, the energy density and uh, hygroscopic nature so we use the torrefaction process and different temperature different time range different holding time so with that we can actually get a good result so uh, this is the reference we used uh, okay thank you yeah okay. thank you thank you mr surajit uh, thanks for the nice presentation so uh, thanks for yes actually giving me second chance Yes, yes, sir. Uh, audience, uh, any questions, please? Okay. So, th uh, thank you once again, Mr. Surajit. Uh, now we can proceed to our next candidate, uh, Mr. Rupam Das. Please proceed with your presentation. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. Is the screen is visible, sir? Mm, yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, please proceed. Good morning, everyone. I am Rupam Das. I just completed my MSc degree from West Bengal State University in Electronics Branch. And I am very much thankful to ICMSME and Regents Institute for giving this opportunity to present my work on designing and analysis of Arduino-based heart rate monitoring system using photoplethysmographic sensor with MATLAB signal processing and IoT applications. So without any further delay, I will start my presentation with a short introductions. After suffering the COVID-19 pandemics, people should be more aware about their health with advancement of the technology. So we always need an auto controls mobile health monitoring systems capable of continuous monitoring while being power is efficient. Mostly, these articles. Uh, Mr. Suraj, uh, sorry for the inter interruption. Uh, can you go to the uh, direct uh, design part? Hello. Hello. Can Hello? you? Uh, yeah. Can you go to the design part directly? Hello. 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 I am Rupam Das, not Surujit. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Rupam. Can you uh, go yes, to the sir. yeah? Can you uh, directly go to the design part? Yes, sir. Yeah. I... Thank you. I went. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can I start, sir? Yes, please proceed. Mm -hmm. well, mostly these articles explore and Arduino microcontroller-based monitoring systems by using photoplethysmographic technique. And we also develop and manuals IR controlled pulse, pulse rate sensor, which can detect our pulse. And this project also gives numerous ideas about the IoT applications regarding the serial data transmissions via Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and GSM support. And our next slide is heart rate and pulse rate. So before entering the ultimate methodology, we have to know the basic difference between heart rate and pulse rate. The human cardiovascular systems consist of blood vessels, heart, and approximately five liter of blood. The heart rate is basically the soundness of human heart. That is nothing but the speed of heartbeat measured by the um, contractions of the beat per minute. And the other hand, Pulse rate is arise due to the ventricular systoles of heart by which the blood is pumped out throughout our body and the some particular positions known as the pulse point in our body. The simultaneous volumetric change of this blood flow per unit times can be detected as pulse rate. And this is the basic difference between the heart rate and pulse rate. And <clears throat> We'll go to the next slide. This is photoplethysmography. And these terms, it is our optical terms, and this is the heart of our project. 
Plutoprithismography is an optical phenomenon which comes from two ancient Greek words, prithismos and grapho. Prithismos means the increase and grapho means right. In any type of PPG technique, the biological tissue have to be illuminated by an incoherent light source, um, like uh, I would say IR signal and any other blue or green light. And the power of the light is either transmitted or reflected from the tissue is measured by the photosensor. In our purpose, we measure the volumetric change of the blood at the pulse point flows per unit times at any pulse point by using the this technique. But um, we have to um, point out that the PPG, any type of PPG signal contains two components, AC component and DC component. AC component is corresponds to the variations of um, arterial blood volume in synchronizations with the heartbeat and the DC component consists of the informations of non-synchronous tissue, venous blood and non-pulsating arterial blood. So we need filtering and after some next slide, we briefly discuss the filtering. And our next slide is the making of pulse sensor circuit fabrications. Here we always also developed um, a manual PPG sensor or photoplethysmographic sensor by using an IR technique. This sensor makes use low intensity IR LED photodiode. And then instead the IR LED, we can also use normal green LED. And if we place this LED and photodiode side by side, the radiation from the um, LED is transmitted uh, uh, the LED is um, emitted, uh, the radiation is emitted and is detected by the photo detector. And if we place our finger and if we place our finger in this method or in this method between the, as an obstacle between this uh, um, IR receiver and, um, and photo detector and IR LED, um, the pulse should be Mm, which are detected as the mm, volumetric change of the blood flow can be detected. And we will go to the next slide. This is filtering. As per the I early mentioned, mm, the, in the synchronized PPG signal, in the synchronized PPG signal, the DC component is arouse, um, arise um, as the optical information of the tissue, tissue venous blood and non-pulsating blood. So we need filtering to cancel out this DC part. And we also use this filtering to remove the unnecessary noise and allow only the desirable bandwidth to our sensor. And we develop a second order bandpass filter in, this, in our manually generated circuit to illuminate this DC part. And after filtering, we get this type of PPG signal in this is the our in lab that this is the DSO configuration. And we get this filtered PPG signal. And after that, we come to our next slide. This is the measurement of our heart rate using an Arduino, which is the basically a microcontroller. The pulse sensor, sensor 11574, is used to acquisitions of the signal from the um, persons whose heart rate is to be measured. The pulse sensor is attached to our finger from which the values are to be acquired. For this purpose, a low cost Arduino microcontroller, Arduino microcontroller has been used with the 80 mega 328P microcontroller IC. And this Arduino read the analog values of the signal from the pulse sensor and convert is it into the digital manner for further processing. This is ultimate the flowchart of the total process to collect the heart rate band. And this is uh, our last slide. It is the basically um, IoT applications of our project. IoT means the Internet of Things. By internet, by using internet, we can transmit 
any types of data by cloud um, system or gsm system and any types of local ne area network communications like bluetooth wi-fi and in here the heart rate um, informations need to be displayed and um, transmitting via bluetooth and uh, um, we need the monitor a patient's virtually so we need this um, transmit this data so we need transmit this data data and for this purpose we use the hc05 bluetooth mod module and bluetooth terminals mobile applications to monitor our patients virtually and hc05 um, module and hc05 module is used as the data transmitter and the bluetooth applications these bluetooth terminal applications used as the data receiver and this was the our total work on the optomechanical integrations of heart rate in the pulse sensor so i am very much thankful to all of you thank you all uh, thank you mr rupam das for your nice presentation uh, yes. this is a, a direct uh, biomedical application so actually this uh, the um, uh, choosing your uh, topic is also very important so yes, thanks for the nice uh, presentation so uh, audience uh, if you have any query please you may proceed okay thank you once again rupam das uh, thank you, okay uh, we can now uh, proceed with our next candidate am i audible yes yes uh, mr imran yes yes please proceed your with your presentation <clears throat> okay so a very good afternoon to all the respected academicians my fellow presenters and all the worthy members of the committee my name is engineer imran arshad and i am a phd student in a department of uh, uh, irrigation and drainage engineering uh, faculty of agriculture engineering sindh agriculture university tanojam pakistan the co-authors of my studies are uh, Dr. Irfan Ahmed Sheikh, Dr. Shakil Hussain Jatha, and uh, Engineer Zahir Ahmed Khan. I would like to welcome you all to my presentation, having a title, uh, Effect of Length of Cutoff Wall on the Seepage Characteristic of a Non-Homogeneous Earth Dam Using Finite Element-Based Software, GeoSlow. Uh, this is the presentation outline for my work. Now, starting with the introduction, actually, what is a dam? Uh, the dam is an impermeable barrier in front of the water flow that is mainly used to store or divert the flow of direction. Dams may fail due to some criteria such as piping, overtopping, and seepage. What is seepage? Seepage is, uh, it is a flow of water through pores or porous media due to potential head difference. Seepage occurs in all types of dams, even in RCC gravity dams. Now, the questions come, uh, why there is a seepage through a dam? Due to potential head difference, there is always occurs a seepage through the body of the dam and its foundation. Now, what will be the adverse effect of seepage on the safety of dam? Uh, uncontrolled seepage through the body of the dam may lead to internal erosion and consequently its failure. It may cause sloughing of downstream slope failure. Seepage may lead to piping failure of the dam. Now how we can control it? The cutoff wall and filter it, it is an efficient way for seepage controlling through a dam foundation. Cutoff wall with various thickness and the depths were suggested as an another alternative for uh, seepage remediation. Installation of cutoff wall or sheet pile can use to control the reduction of the exit gradient and seepage flux. Now there are several methods to analyze seepage uh, in which uh, some of them are uh, analytical, experimental and uh, finite element analysis. So in our work, we have uh, work uh, on a geoslope software, which is a finite element based software. So let us discuss something about finite element. Finite element analysis is a 
con uh, computational scheme in which the domain of interest is discretized into a smaller elements by imaginary nodal points and field variables of the interest are simulated and analyzed over the whole domain of interest under different scenarios with the detailed and precise solutions. Here are some of the examples for finite element analysis. Now, uh, GeoSlope software, this is the software which we have used in our study. It is developed in 2003 and uh, it is capable to analyze groundwater seepage and uh, excess pore water pressure dissipation problems. This is the governor journal equation, which is used by the CW software to compute the results. The objectives of our study is to analyze the seepage flow, exit gradient and maximum seepage velocity through the body and the foundation of the non-homogeneous earth dam at various uh, reservoir levels for three different cases. That is the uh, original design, dam with a partial cutoff wall and dam with full cutoff wall. This is the location of uh, Hub Dam. It is uh, located 35 kilometers away from Karachi in, uh, at uh, Hub River. These are some of the salient features of Hub Dam. Uh, this, uh, this is the flow chart which describes uh, the stepping of that how we have created the model. Initially by using GeoSlope software, the geometric models were created and uh, steady state analysis was selected to simulate the hydraulic condition beneath the dam foundation. After that, the material was first created and calibrated using trial and error method and uh, then applied to different regions. The up and downstream slope boundary conditions are assigned as ditchlets and uh, Newman boundary nodes. The nodes at the bottom of the foundation of the dam are considered as zero flux. Finally, by using the solve manager, the mesh was verified, analyzed and uh, solved for computation. And finally, the simulated result has been obtained by uh, as an output. This is the cross section of the hub dam on which we have studied in our uh, research work. Uh, this is the mesh formation which is generated by using GeoSlow. Uh, here are three cases. This one is for the original design. The second one is for uh, the partial cutoff wall. And the third one is for uh, uh, the dam having a full cutoff wall. These are the hydraulic conductivity and uh, geological parameters which we have uh, uh, provided to the model. And uh, these are the uh, hydraulic conductivities which we have obtained uh, for, uh, through a trial and error method. These are the simulated results. Uh, this is uh, the result for the case one. This is for uh, the, the result when the reservoir height was at uh, 270 feet. And uh, likewise, uh, this is at the 339 feet and 346. Here we can see the flow net and uh, the equipotential lines and phreatic line. Uh, this slide shows uh, another view of case one that uh, we can see that uh, from the upstream slope, the phreatic line uh, is uh, passing through the shell and uh, while it is going to the downstream, it is falling into the filter drain. So there will be no any cutting of the downstream slope, So it, which means that the dam is safe against piping. Likewise, uh, these are the simulated results for case two. These are the results for case two for the phreatic line behavior. And uh, this is the result for uh, case three, when the dam is with the full uh, cutoff wall. Here we can see the uh, equipotential line and flow net uh, didn't develop because of uh, there was no base flow. All the flow was uh, uh, through the shell only. These are the overall results which we have obtained for seepage flux, exit gradient and maximum seepage velocity. Uh, this is the graphical relationship for uh, seepage flux as likewise for exit gradient and for maximum seepage velocity. Now I will conclude my uh, presentation. The phreatic line pattern follows standard design for each case which entails that the dam safety is not endangered from the seepage point of view. 
the exit gradient value is within a permissible limit for each case that is uh, less than unity uh, estimated uh, seepage flux is minimum and maximum seepage velocity is within safe limits the imperviousness of the foundation material is pre predominant over shell material therefore the use of partial cutoff wall and full cutoff wall may not contribute much to lower down the various flow parameters respectively the numerical model model give uh, a deep understanding for hydraulic and geotechnical problem hence it can be concluded that uh, hub dam perform effectively since its construction at its original shape and design uh these are the references uh, used in our study and uh, by this i would like to give uh, rest to my presentation if there are any questions i would welcome the questions thank you very much for your having me yes uh, thank you mr imran uh, thanks for the uh, very uh, this beautiful presentation so audience uh, any questions Uh, Mr. Imran, uh, can you tell me what is a non-homogeneous dam? Uh, sir, the non-homogeneous dam is the dam in which uh, the core is uh, present. Uh, yani, uh, if uh, when we are putting the material inside the shell and uh, there are uh, two types of material, uh, if the dam is filled only with one type, it is okay. homogeneous. But when okay. we are uh, providing it with the core into the center, Okay. then it becomes the non homogeneous because of difference of hydraulic conductivity of the filled material okay okay uh, thank you mr imran uh, so uh, i think we can proceed uh, to the next next candidate so okay thanks thanks yes. for questioning listening and uh, your kind attention yes yes thank you thank you mr imran okay sir am i audible sir Yes, uh, Mr. Saptarsi, right? Yes, sir. Ah, yes, please proceed. Sir, because of some uh, unfortunate uh, circumstances, I am yes. not able to present right now. So my co-author is presenting here in front of us. Yes, yes. Suhel, sir. either. Okay. So Suhel, okay. you can proceed. Yes. Yes, Mr. Suhel. Hello, Mr. Suhel. Suhail, you are not audible. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Oh, now sorry. Yes, yes. You are audible. Please go ahead. Oh. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Suhail Aydar. I'm from mechanical fourth year from IEM. Uh, first of all, thanks everyone. Thank you for everyone for giving us opportunity to present my paper on topic motorized solar scarecrow birds animal repellent. So these are our table of contents for this uh, paper. First of all, uh, uh, what is a scarecrow? As the name suggests, these are uh, meant to actually scare away birds from farmlands. Uh, actually, we all know that uh, birds are known to make extensive economic harm assortment to, of crops during weak stages in various agro nature natural locals of the country. So, uh, I, I, so our aim is not to eliminate the birds from the nature for the sake of only crop production but uh, our aim is to keep the birds away from the crops so that farmer gets their income properly so what the problem existing natural uh, scarecrow actually these are the uh, as uh, picture suggested these are the manual scarecrow which are made by the farmer farmers uh, they are not able to do the job of keeping the birds at bay and nowadays a scarecrow have these scarecrows have rarely proven to be effective in keeping the birds away from the uh, fields uh, all we know that uh, today's birds are very smart enough to notice that it is not an actual human because uh, of uh, because I, this, uh, this doesn't move so our uh, so our aim is to to solve this problem uh, we here by designing a solar powered moving a scarecrow that auto detects the bird sound and operate its arm using a motor along with shouting sound to scare away birds and animals so that uh, it can keep the birds away from the farmland so the uh, the farmer's income got, don't get harmed and uh, economy will be good here we are using solar energy so uh, this is a, a zero waste product now uh, this shows the working of a budget movement 
uh, first of all let me explain this uh, the system makes use of a controller uh, a dc motor battery solar panel which will uh, run the overall machine uh, gears and linkages which will uh, help in movement of the arm so the solar panel constantly charge the battery of the system during daytime at the mic in the system constantly monitors sound level in the environment whenever uh, any birds came uh, any birds will come or any noise uh, come sound levels is detected in the environment this signal is monitored by the controller and it triggers an action after that the dc motor is powered which rotates and after uh, after that uh, entire arm mechanism start working the rotation of motor shaft rotates the gear connected to uh, connected to the uh, dc motor uh, which sets a motion uh, in the limbed arm mechanism uh, this overall mechanism allow for moving the arms uh, in human like motion vertically which uh, which actually feels like a, it uh, it's a, uh, feels like a, it is a uh, movement of a, uh, any human so the controller operator also uh, there is a speaker uh, installed in this uh, which will produce some uh, noise so that birds and animals in the near fields too are scared so as overall the system put forth a modern solar powered scarecrow to protect birds from birds and animals so what the features of this model uh, so uh, our project uh, our paper uh, our the project uh, is uh, uh, it has a sound detector to detect birds or animal presence and it's a human uh, and it produces human like hand motion to scare birds and animals also these uh, it, it's a almost net zero carbon product as uh, there is no external source of energy like electricity or fossil fuels so um, it's a uh, help in achieving net zero um, and also these uh, these are uh, fully automatic so it's a lever extensive project it can be mounted anywhere in the field anywhere in the versatile condition so as we uh, as we said application uh, this can provide a day night security to the farmers this can also give the uh, protection of crops from the theft also in the night uh, this will uh, very helpful as uh, it uh, minimizes the labor uh, manual labor so that's all and uh, future scope of this uh, our model is that uh, addition of manual water sprinkler as uh, we can implement uh, we can add a manual uh, water sprinkler uh, so as we uh, as birds or any human beings touch the uh, model it, it will get activated uh, this will keep off the birds as well not only this uh, it will be also helpful in uh, those crops which uh, flourishes in sprinkler irrigation uh, here uh, in this uh, project we can also implement a sound box of certain frequency of frequency between 1 kilohertz and 8 kilohertz this is a range of frequency in uh, in this uh, in this uh, frequency range birds are not able to uh, uh, you know sustain because uh, this will create uh, data to the birds from roaming around the farmland uh, this will uh, produce irritating sound so birds will not sustain there uh, so that's all uh, this was good. Uh, these are the references uh, which we have taken uh, help. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Sohail. Uh, thanks for uh, choosing agriculture based uh, uh, topics. So, yes, audi audiences, uh, please, uh, any questions? If you have any queries, please ask them. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sohel, once again. So thank can... you, sir. Thank you yes. for the opportunity. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, we can uh, proceed with the, our next candidate. It's our uh, next candidate. Yeah, but I need to go for your presentation. Rest of the clear. 
Okay, हेलो एस मिस फारिन हेलो मिस Is Akhtar Ali present now? Hello, he's Akhtar. I think we should move on. Yeah, he's present now. Hello. Yes. Uh, can we move with our next candidate? Yeah, she is done. Sorry, one two four. Ranit Kumar. Ranit Kumar, are you there? Yeah, I am audible. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Start your PPT. Share it. Okay, go for present for present presentation. I think the slide is visible and the slide is moving. Yes, yes, Mr. Ranit, please uh, go ahead with your uh, presentation. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, all. I am Ranit Karmukar, uh, Prime Minister Research Fellow from the Department of uh, Metallurgical and Materials Engineering, IIT Kharagpur. I am presenting our review paper on the topic of recent trends in friction-based welding of metal and polymers. Other co-authors are. Pavitra Maji and uh, Rahul Kantinath from the uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering, Regent Education, uh, Re Regent Education and Found Research Foundation. So, in the new trend, in the new trend throughout the world is to use the lightweight and high strength material for the environment friendly nature and the safer application, especially in the field of aerospace, defense, and automobile sector. So uh, the, the use of polymer, aluminium, and the magnesium like alloys are very much applicable in these type of industries due to their uh, 
uh, high uh, weldability, good strength and uh, good strength to weight ratio and the corrosion resistance, etc. Sometimes they have used, like in hybrid structure, uh, hybrid, uh, this is called hybrid structure when we are using metal and polymers both in the same structure. So, and uh, in the case studies, in the we have seen that the in uh, Audi R8 model, they have used aluminium alloy as well as polymer matrix composite in the same body structure. So sometimes we are uh, the, the industry needs to join in the same structure in the in the in the same structure. So uh, when it comes to metal and polymer both, so we uh, we are normally avoiding the conventional methods of uh, welding, where the uh, direct heat is needed but in this uh, in this sector of the friction star uh, processing and modeling uh, we are using not heat we are using frictional heat uh, to join this uh, metal and polymer both it is very much advantageous because of solid state process low distortion and good dimensional stability and excellent mechanical properties in the joint area to replace and and the replace the multiple parts joined by the fasteners and uh, uh, in this literature review we can see in the uh, it is very interesting to note that that uh, that is a uh, the, they are making a pin to solve this uh, solve this welding process where um, the pinless tool is plunged into the uh, into the metal plate and the frictional heat is generated between the tool and shoulder and the metallic uh, plates great transform to the polymer plate and the resultant heat in the polymer softens the metal and the uh, semi-solid or liquid polymer moves upward then the vertical movement of the polymer is restricted by the shoulder and uh, shoulder surface and consequently the hole is filled by the horizontal or the vortex flow in the adhesive uh, techniques And uh, here we can show the mechanism that the clamping tool holds the weld material and the push uh, and push uh, nearly half into the metal plate. And that plasticized material filled the cavity while rotating uh, rotating pin retracts from the downward to the upward. And the sleeve retracts, then retracts, and the pin is pushed to full uh, to fill the hole left. And uh, from, 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 from that, we can see that there is a, a numb-like structure after the welding it is formed. And uh, after, uh, uh, besides that, the, there is a, another method of to join the metal and polymer is the friction-based stacking. Here, the metal plate with the poly, uh, and the polymer plate with the stud is used. So the start is inserted in the metal plate with a hole and then the uh, tools with a we, uh, we, uh, two tools are approaching uh, through, uh, through the through the start and the hole and by the and uh, after after the rotating the frictional heat is going to uh, melt the polymer and the uh, by the metallic uh, mechanical interlocking the joining happens there, yeah, uh, the, um, uh, <clears throat> the microstructure, microstructure of different uh, joining have shown that in the um, uh, in the in the first figure we can see the polymer with the aluminium aluminium joint have shown by the friction star uh, spot welding. The no uh, no ho hole is made normally, uh, and uh, we can see the in the uh, polynidal surface uh, and the aluminum, uh, aluminum they have divided the surface into the um, numb zone then the uh, partially deformed zone then the uh, transition zone and the last is the adhesion zone and the another microstructure we can see from the from, from the uh, adhesion zone that uh, the polymeric in the polymeric polymeric structure and the fibers are uh, through thoroughly attached in the in the matrix uh, in the matrix of the metal so the high strength can be a uh, high strength can be obtained from this matter in this uh, in this microstructure they have shown that uh, 
Uh, they have shown that in the central zone, in the central zone, there is the grain shortening is there because of the high heat accumulation at the center. For that, the micro hardness can be enriched in this region and the mechanical strength also getting higher and higher. Uh, Mr. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, Mr. Ranit, uh, can you please uh, fast forward your presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, in the in the TEM structure of the uh, of metal and polymer, they have shown that uh, alum, uh, aluminium with the uh, with different condition have uh, joined uh, aluminium with different alloy is joined in, at the inter uh, at the interface by the by the oxide uh, and the oxide is uh, prominent in the EDS maps of the TEM. And the another method, they have uh, pin structured aluminium. They surface surface, and by the laser treatment, the pin was the pin was uh, fabricated in the layer. And by this, by the heat of uh, heat of the friction, the aluminium is adhered to the uh, polymeric structure. And this is the conclusion from our uh, study. And thank you. And this is the reference. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anit. Thanks for uh, this uh, wonderful review presentation. Uh, so, uh, audience, any questions? Okay. Uh, thanks, Mr. Ranit, once again. Uh, so, we can uh, we will proceed with our next candidate. Yes, uh, next candidate, please proceed with your presentation. Sir, I, Narendra Kumar Sharma, shall I start? Yes, yes, please proceed with your presentation. Yeah. Yes, sir. Excuse me, excuse me, I'm in the first in the serial. Sorry to say, I'm waiting for Mr. Yeah. Banarsi Pandey to present. Okay, sir, no Let problem. You continue. Okay, uh, so. Yes, Mr. Dilip Singh. Yeah, please proceed with your presentation. You can see my screen. Yeah. Yes. yes. Hi, good yes. afternoon, everyone. My name is Dilip, uh, Dilip Kumar Singh, and basically I'm an industrial professional. So now my topic is that oil and gas facility compressor dry soil gas system contamination failure and mitigations. So as you know, oil and gas is one of the most important commodities and oil itself account 3% of the GDP. And to process these facilities are very important, reliable and very need to be a costly part of things. So so the, my introduction, basically in the decade ago, the, the compressor, the basically the centrifugal compressor are utilized to process this uh, oil and gas uh, facilities and transport through the pipeline. So the centrifugal compressor is one of the most important part components and to make it reliable, the seal gas system in decade ago was utilized wet cells. So in the latest development, they now updated and utilizing the dry seal gas to avoid the process contamination and catalyst poisoning and unscheduled breakdowns and failures. So this dry seal gas systems, when it's implemented, it also comes with some challenges. So basically when the challenges comes, when they started to install this new technology with the compressors, they found there's some contamination which is also uh, damaging the process gas and which is coming in contact with the process gas is uh, yeah, it's condensed and making liquefied in some process so when, when we thought about the cleanliness of the process gas due to change of temperature and pressures and the seal uh, contaminations this make the seal failures and unreliable you know the com equipment itself get failed during the process and failure of such kind of important equipments make the huge productions loss and it's a millions losses are counted millions so basically this part of the sections are petroleum institutions develop some standards and we come with the solution to flush this kind of contaminations so when we come with the startup challenges we saw the contaminated particles we filter through the one of the specialized kit developed by dynamic and we saw the challenges and we remedies that one and also we do the same kind of process with the post-operational 
and we just cut the filter bags on one microns and see the how this contamination are coming and making the failures of the process equipment so basically here i'm not showing the exact equipment it's confidential matter i'm just showing the sketch layout is basic sketch where we have the pumps and the tank and the filtration is kit which have a one micron filters and this is kit designed basically on taking a factor of safety's maximum renewals number to be achieved to flush the system and clean as fast as possible to avoid the production losses so here you can see the schematic of the seal gas system with the compressors and you can see there's a pump which is uh, handle the flammable liquid so the fluid which is utilized to process and flush this that is ipa isopropyl alcohol which itself uh, absorb the moistures and evaporate itself in its open conditions so but as it is a high flammable liquid and it's uh, vaporization uh, flash gas temperature is 12 degrees celsius it's another challenge to perform this activity so it's recommended to perform in the night time where the ambient temperature are lower and as much as possible and release the vapors with the mix with the nitrogen gas so here's the process parameters where we go through the flow and uh, based on the ambient temperature the viscosity and densities are varies and we found the maximum renewals number achieved to complete the activity in efficient way quickly so here I, my conclusion is there so basically when we perform the filtration we recommend that to go with the one micron filtration to avoid this three to five micron particles to uh, damage the seal systems and keep um, me in contact with the process gases and after the flush, we have to try the systems and confirm the dew point, the system. Because in initial methodology, they proposed for purging and that's still not suitable to clean the system and dry. That's all. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Dilip Singh. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Dilip Singh, uh, may I know your uh, company? I mean, which, uh, from yeah, which? It's yeah. Ener Enermec OGP. Okay, it is situated in yeah. location. Uh, currently, it's it's a MNC company. Currently, I'm in Azerbaijan. Okay, okay, from Azerbaijan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dilip Singh, for your nice presentation. So, audiences, uh, you you have any query, please uh, ask. Him. Okay then, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dilip Singh, uh, thank you once again. Uh, we'll uh, thank you for the, yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Yes. 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 Thank you. So our next candidate. Uh... Yes, sir. I Narendra Kumar Sharma, sir. Yes. Yes. Please proceed. Yes, sir. Yes. So good afternoon, sir, and all the respected teachers and the faculty member. I Narendra Kumar Sharma, student of, of Department of Mechanical Engineering, Regent Education and Research Foundation. And the, my topic is, sir, an overview of a solenoid motor. So, sir, right now, the current situation, what we have saw that in the past and now, that during Russia and Ukraine war, the price of fuel were very high. And thereafter, not only that, and the major demerits are, that that fuels are also increasing the carbon dioxide which are injurious for health so to reduce that uh, emission of carbon here in this paper i have proposed that in the with the help of magnetic power we can generate a solenoid motor and with that solenoid motor without using any fuel we can make a make our car or any automobile item that can be used in industries as well as in our daily life so here it is our the introduction in, in introduction what i have written that the world is growing and the advancement of technology is expanding and our automobile industry is also expanding so to solve the problem a green vehicle technology will be used to save biofuel solar fuel sorry not biofuel to save the carbon to save the fuel for our future generation and at present there are many electric vehicle which are more efficient than petrol or diesel vehicle, but they are not giving so much result as compared to internal combustion engine. So that's why here I am proposed 
for making the solenoid motor the requirements are the component that is electromagnetic solenoid when an electric when a current carrying conductor is wound on a magnetic material it act as a magnet till the conductor is alive so that's why the electromagnets electromagnetic solenoid there will be used to make an artificial magnet so we do not rely on the natural magnets and thereafter this connecting rod a connecting rod will be used which will act as a piston to in reciprocating the engine and together with the crank it form a simple mechanism that change the reciprocating motion into rotating motion thereafter the proximity sensor the proximity sensor is a sensor able to detect the presence of nearby object without any physical contact and the distance is also given that the normal range it is the maximum distance beyond that it can't work thereafter the relay a relay is a electrically operated or electromechanical switch composed of an electromagnet and armature and a spring and a set of electrical contact it permits a small amount of electrical current to control high current load to control the speed the relay will act as a speed controller to accelerate or deaccelerate thereafter the crank a crank shaft is a mechanical part able to perform a conversion between the reciprocating motion and rotational motion thereafter is our wheel which will help in accelerating or move the one body to another the working sir is like that the working principle of solenoid motor here what we can see that there are two solenoid which are fit and thereafter the piston connecting rod and crankshaft flying wheel mounted on a base thereafter sir the main idea behind the concept is to modify the existing ic engine into an electromagnetic reciprocating engine by replacing the spark plug by an strong electromagnet and conductor thereafter sir the mechanical sub system consists of a piston which reciprocate with a guide way made of a non magnetic material the cylinder will also be open for the atmosphere thereafter sir the particularly in our system the standard engine was of v type twin cylinder configuration it consists of two connecting rods like commonly to one crankshaft which later become the output shaft and thereafter sir when the electromagnet on top of the cylinder is excited by an ac supply it acquires positive and negative charges for each half of the supply thereafter sir this led to the attraction and repulsion of the permanent magnet on the piston and thereafter sir and thereafter this to and fro motion of the piston make the cylinder rotate the crankshaft which make the wheels to rotate and this cause the motion of the wheel and sir there are the literary source where i have taken and what what are the my work there has been given and the sir the last part is conclusion the conclusion is that at the end of the prototype what they have made and what i have calculated that the prototype engine was successfully manufactured thereafter it used electricity as an output no fuel is consumed the accelerator is done by controlling the timer which control the relay and the maximum efficiency obtained was 21.22 at 229 rpm for an input input current of 1.2 ampere and the maximum output obtained was 20.7 watt at 249 rpm for an input current of 7.5 ampere and sir at last these are the reference and thank you sir thank you for this opportunity yes mr narendra yes, uh, thank you for this uh, nice presentation uh, one more thing is that uh, you should uh, also include one cost analysis for this uh, kind of uh, engine because uh, see like you need electricity for this for running this engine right yes sir uh, so the thing is how much electricity is also coming from the coal industry nowadays so uh, that is why you have uh, you should have one uh, do one more analysis that how much cost uh cost analysis must be done okay sir thank you sir in future i will definitely make it thank yes, you sir yes yes please yes thank you so audience is any questions please okay uh thank you mr narendra uh so now we will proceed to our next candidate yes next candidate please uh share your screen please
Ms. Labon is there? Are you present? And Mr. Jitik Mandol? Paper ID 147. Jitik Mandol. Are you present? Rajiv Khan, Paper ID 130. Rajni Sanan, or anyone from your class? Is there anyone left who you want to present? Your <laughs> Okay, then I think we should conclude our session. Thank you, Dr. Kabati, for your valuable time and your valuable inputs for the betterment of the conference. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Sir, am I audible? Sir, am I audible? Sir, am I audible? Sir, am I audible? Am I audible? Am I audible?